On today's episode of Locked In, I have a super, super exciting story for you. I'm sitting down with AJ Galante, who's from my hometown, Danbury, Connecticut. AJ's story is incredible from owning and being the president of the Danbury Trashers, which was recently featured in a Netflix documentary called Crime and Penalties, to his father going to federal prison on relation to his ties with the mob. In this episode, we dive into AJ's upbringing, his time running the Danbury Trashers, what it was like to visit his father in federal prison, and how he was able to create an act two for himself by opening up Champs Boxing in Danbury and starting a whole new life. Also, before we dive into today's episode, I just want to thank you guys, man. We were in the top 50 on Spotify last week for, for society and culture. It is incredible how fast this podcast has grown in such a short amount of time. I appreciate you guys all that listen, tune in, and bear with us as we continue to grow and learn from this whole podcasting experience. Also, if you guys could take a second, just please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts from. It really helps us progress the show and get it out there to more people. Hope you guys enjoy my interview with AJ Galante. This really hits home for me because AJ's from my hometown and our stories are so similar and so connected, yet so different. And I hope you guys enjoy Locked In with Ian Bick. AJ Galante, welcome to Locked In, man. It is such an honor to be sitting here with you today. Um, I don't even know what to say, man. Like I've like I've known of you for so long, but we never really like met or connected like really close until this year. And I just feel like you've always been a part of my life in some way. And I like really look up to you. And it's been like my dream to have you on this pod since we first started when we first talked about it and we finally made the time. No, I appreciate the opportunity, man. Same thing. It's like, you know, Danbury in the house right now. It's <laughs> it's weird because it's like same thing. I knew of you and um you know, you, you'd hear things and, and I was just like, oh, the kid's running a club. That's hilarious. I loved it. You know, I was just like, it's just, he's, it's right up my alley. You know what I mean? That's, that's my type of guy. So uh, it's, it's so funny. Like I said, to connect and, um, you know, it's, it's crazy because it's, you know, we're, it's, where we're from, it's a small, you know, city, but, um, you know, never until this year really, you know, run into each other. So it's, it's, uh, appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. We live these like sensational crazy type stories in different time periods. Like yours was yeah. like early 2000s and mine was like after 2010. And like our stories are so connected yet so different. It is. And then and, and the same thing. I mean, um, you know, when, when I heard, you know, cause obviously both of us have been in the news one, you know, good, bad and different. And same thing when, when uh, I started hearing about you, you know, um, you know, no one, people I was close with didn't know you know you either and they're like hey have you heard about that kid and I would kind of vaguely look through it I'm like wow that's a, that's a crazy that's a crazy story and uh that's like you said just crazy stories that's that's yeah. what we have it's 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 nuts man I think the listeners are really going to appreciate like hearing about like where I came from kind yeah. of like to see that correlation of what Danbury is and yeah. also to hear your story yeah, with the spotlight being on you and your craziness. So starting at the beginning, like we know you're from Danbury, Connecticut or that area. Yeah. How did you grow up? What's your childhood like? Childhood was, um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, that's such a funny question. Cause I, look, it was a good childhood. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't brought up in the streets. I wasn't brought up tough that way, but from a young age, I was around a lot of gritty, different stuff. You know what I mean? And it's weird because um, it's just so normal. And when you look back, I mean, I'm going to be 37 years old in a month or two, two months, Jesus. And, um, you know, I kind of look back and it's nothing abnormal, but I guess compared to the majority of people, I know it it could be an abnormal story. You know what I mean? Um, you know, my father was a big deal on, you know, the, the largest... Uh, you know, sanitation companies on the East Coast, basically. So he was, you know, I was always, um, I was always at the garbage yard, you know what I mean? On the summer, you know, I, it's not, I don't say it to sound funny or cool, but that's how it was. The summers, 90% of it was at the garbage yard, you know what I mean? And, and from a young age, five to like 12, you know, 
my time at the garbage yard was just in the office with my father observing stuff. So I didn't even know what I was doing. I was just sitting there with them. You know what I mean? And uh, you just, I, I really realized, you know, how young kids could absorb a lot of th just, you know, just experiences, seeing things. And, uh, but I had a good childhood, you know, um, you know, large family, lots of cousins. Um, you know, I, I can't. Uh, you and a uh, mom, dad, sister. Yeah, both both my parents. Um, my parents, uh, my sister's younger, four years younger than me. Um, I guess you would call it pretty normal. I, but I've always felt like I had, I don't want to say two lives, but I've always felt like, you know, you had like my regular home life. And then it was just like, you know, I'd be out with my dad or, or at the office or the garbage yard. It just felt different, you know? And it, and looking back, it was different, but uh, I wouldn't trade it for the world, honestly. Were you aware of it at the time that like you had a different lifestyle, that like your dad was very successful and that your life was different? I mean, I was watching the Netflix documentary and you literally had, what, the biggest pro wrestlers in the world <laughs> at your birthday party. Oh, man. Th that's not normal. You know, my dad always seemed, at a young age, my dad always seemed larger than life to me. You know, and I think most, look, you have a father, you know, most, all boys have fathers, but fathers that are in a boy's life, um, they're always like bigger than life, I guess, to a kid. But it just seemed different with my dad. I mean, we'd be out and about and everybody would come up to him and this and that. And he just, he always had a nice car. And um, yeah, man, it was like, he just... He has a presence and without even trying. He doesn't like, like there's people that try to impose their will or try to, you know, press up on you or something like that. But my dad doesn't, he just has, he could just walk in and, you know, he could be on the other side of the building. You just know he's there. It's weird. It's it's hard to explain, but he's always had that that presence to him. So I guess in that sense, I, I, I just, you know, because I'd go over friends' houses and be with their parents and, you know, you, I'm always respectful to, you know, guys but my dad just commanded a different type of respect it was weird and it wasn't like he was trying it's just a natural thing for him did you like gravitate gravitate towards that and kind oh of yeah idolize that? oh i wanted um i'm so much like my father in so many ways it's it's weird and i don't know if he'd ever admit that you know because my dad is a one of a kind but I, i've um sometimes i'll be at the gym in the office and you know it's it's uh same thing the gym's a little gritty and so but it's like i catch myself thinking or talking like not trying to be like you know like him you know but i just like wow i just sounded like my dad back in like 97 <laughs> you know and it's it's weird it's just um it's just what you grow up with i just you're you know when you say you're a product of an environment i don't necessarily say that's your town or your zip code it's the people around you you know what i mean and um you just kind of morph you you kind of you 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 gel into who you're around it's it's i really believe that what's like middle school and early high school like for you all about wrestling you know when my first love was like pro wrestling i was convinced ian i swear to you i was going to be a wrestler and my mom to this day it's funny because you know i went to my first wrestling match it was madison square Garden. i want to say 93 94 and i was just hooked and um you know, like most people in the night, you know, most, most of my buddies, you know, all were wrestling fans, but me and another kid named Mike, we were just on a different level of this love. And I swear to you, you know, my mom would use wrestling against me. If I got in trouble or oh, you're not watching wrestling, my mom to this day still has a letter. I slid under her door. I want to say 97, 98, I got in trouble. Don't know what I did. And she said, well, you're not watching the pay-per-view tomorrow, whatever the wrestling event was. And my mom, and I got to get it because I'd like to frame it, to be honest with you. I wrote an essay of how I won't do anything wrong again. I, I need wrestling. I was like a, I sounded like a, a crackhead, to be honest with you. I was like, I need wrestling in my life. I can't live without it, please. Like, and I think she ended up letting me watch it. But uh, that she brought that up like about a year ago. She like, look what I found. And, you know, she's got all my old diplomas and report cards and she had this wrestling like just pleading with my mom that's so interesting because i used to do the same thing like, oh except it was house parties they'd yes. say no more house parties yes, yes. and i wrote a letter saying I everything that was our, i slid it right under the door uh i think it was in an envelope and everything and uh but yeah wrestling you know middle school high you know middle school especially was just all about wrestling and then i got into hockey you know started playing you know we didn't have a danbury ice arena when i was in middle school so we'd have to go to brewster and you know, it's just, uh, it was wrestling hockey, wrestling hockey, but more so wrestling. When I got into high school, it, it kind of, you know, wrestling was always part of my life, but it kind of turned more into about hockey. And, um, you know, you just, uh, you know, you know, 
going to the garbage yard at the summers. You know what I mean? It was kind of like, you know, during school it was sports and wrestling. And then the summer just felt like it was just all about working and uh, going to the yard. Did you go to Danbury High? No. So I went to New Fairfield School. So I lived right on the border. So I always wanted to go to Danbury schools because my cousins were in Danbury and stuff. But I actually ended up, you know, because I lived on the border going to New Fairfield schools, which looking back, I'm kind of happy I did because it was a little more intimate settings with the schools and stuff like that. And uh, but yeah, no, I went to New Fairfield High School. Yeah. Are you a studious type person, like getting good grades or how, how was like your academics? I was just lazy. You know, you know what it is? I'll be honest with you. You know, I kind of knew early on I'm going to work with my dad. You know, it wasn't like, what do you want to be when you grow up? An astronaut, a president, you know, a, a ball player. I just knew I was going to just work with my dad. It was like an unwritten, unsaid thing. So in a way, I was very lazy because it was like, you know, I, I wasn't a bad student. I could have got straight A's if I wanted to, but I was just lazy because I was just like, you know. Do you think you like had it all set or do you want to, did you actually want to work I, for it? No, I, uh, I knew I was a hard worker. But I was always around, I was always behind the eight ball, to be honest, Ian, because, you know, when you grow up, my dad was, you know, he was a little flashy, too. He had nice cars. You know, we had money. You know, I mean, I mean, we weren't billionaires, but we weren't, you know, we weren't uh, worrying about food for the week, you know. So for me, it was almost embarrassing because I always felt like I had more than other people. And, and, you know, as a man, it's like you don't want to be looked at as the guy that's, uh, you know, spo I hate the word spoiled. I say I was very fortunate. And um it forced me, you know, respect is a big thing for me. And I felt like I was an underdog when it came to gaining respect. Because, you know, you know, as a, especially as a young kid, oh, this kid, oh, he's, a, oh, he's spoiled. He has everything he wants. I didn't want to be known as that. So I feel like I had a switch and I tried to be um, at times overly tough, I guess you could say. I, I always was attracted to like, um, you know, when I would play sports, I was very aggressive. And I think that was part of trying to gain a respect thing. Kind of like jail, right? You know, guys <laughs> that go to jail, you know, they're trying to impose their will. I mean, I guess in a weird sense, that's what I wanted. I didn't want to be known as a spoiled little brat because um, I know on the surface, some people may have thought that, but I know I wasn't. I mean, I wasn't a punk. Um, and again, I was working. I mean, these kids were hanging out at home during the summers. I was in a garbage yard. It smelled in there. It was horrible. I, then my dad put me to work. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't. My dad, um, he made sure I stayed pretty, very, very humble. Yeah, what were some like values he instilled on you at that young age? Humble. It was always, um, you know, he would always, you know, you know, he'd tell you the, you know, the patent. You know, I had to walk uphill both ways to school. You know how dads do, but um, yeah. it was true in a lot of his senses. You know, and uh, as you get older, you start to realize, wow, he was telling the truth. It was like that for him. And uh, we grew up very different. Obviously, he came from, you know nothing dirt and he made something you know he had to work very hard to get to you know just to make a dollar really so being humble I think that's why he always wanted me at the garbage yard because um you know it's a humbling place to be it's not like you know there's nothing really flashy about it and um I'd be out so you know when I got a little older I'd be out I'd be out in the uh, transfer station separating recycling garbage you know it was rats running all over the place it was uh i think he got a weird joy out of it too i think it was funny because you know he was working you know, when he was a kid you know he had to work on his father's truck before he even went to school so it was always being humble and he humbled me many times you know and um that's that's important i think it all comes down to being humble and and you know earning respect yeah now that you're older are you more aware of how other kids might have thought of you that didn't oh. see the behind the scenes Ian, I still to this day have a chip on my shoulder. You know, I'm going to be, I, I'm, I'm 30, I'm a grown man. I'm going to be 37 and I still have a chip on my shoulder. Like I have something to prove, um, you know, and, uh, it's, it's just, I just think we all kind of have our thing, what we're trying to overcome. Some people overcome poverty. Some people, you know, it's funny guys that overcome poverty. I've learned and have money to last two lifetimes are always afraid of going broke. You know what I mean? It's just because they had to overcome that fear of, I had nothing, I gained it, I could lose it. Me, it's the respect thing. It's, um, I've, oh, I always feel like, you know, you gotta earn the respect, um, you know, one way or the other. And uh, that, I just think we all have that one little thing that just will stick with us forever. That's just my feeling, you know, and that's, that's, but no, I've always seen how it would look. 
you know, I, I'm at the gym and I see a 17 year old and I'm thinking, man, imagine giving that kid a hockey team or something. You know what I mean? I'm like, I couldn't imagine. So I, I, I understood at a young age, you know, when I got these opportunities, it was like, man, I'm going to get a lot of shit for this and, and people are going to think this. But you know, I got to an age where I was like, you know, what? I don't care. I'm just going to take the risk. I'm going to do it. You know, I mean, and there was a lot of pressure. I mean, I, I tell people to this day, my dad would fire me if he had to. And I, t I, I tell people, I promise you, if he had to, my dad would fire me. So I always felt the pressure. And I always felt like I had to reward him for believing in me. Or I had to reward anyone who had, showed any faith in me. To I'd have to work double as hard. But people didn't see that behind the scenes. Like they think no. of, they thought you were like the rich kid or this yeah, and that. Yeah, sure, of course. I mean, um, nice clothes, nice shoes, nice cars, you know, and... Um, and I don't blame them because people don't know. I mean, you don't know any better. I mean, um, that's like people that don't know me and my no, story. No, they, they look at and they, they, you know, but I learned that early. I'm like, you know what? I mean, people don't have a clue. I mean, we all have a story. Um, some of us just get lucky enough to have it told sometimes. And it's what you do with it. I mean, look at, look at what you did with your situation. I mean, some guys would just be happy. Oh, I got a, you know, a, a special TV. Look at me. And that's it. You've turned it into something. That's why I say it's it's like it's not you know don't don't judge someone based on what they're given judge them what they do with what they're given you know what I mean it's like anyone could give anyone anything it's like what do you do with it and um I'm the same way if I'm given an opportunity how do I parlay that into something bigger you know plant these seeds and and it's just, I watch you from afar and up close and it's like you do you know you didn't, this isn't luck. I mean, it's a beautiful studio. You got a huge following right now. I mean, you didn't, that's, you didn't just wake up one day, snap your finger and, and you get it. And I think that's what people's, and it's, you know, it's a jealousy thing too. I mean, people, usually malicious, jealous people feel that way. They're like, oh, he's, you know, that he's so lucky and this and that, but. I mean, yeah, me and the guys were talking about it earlier, like HBO, Vice, they didn't give yeah. this to me. Like no. this was, this was hard work put in from no. the ground and it, and it's not about me anymore. Like it's so no, much bigger. It's a movement. Yeah. And, and that's what it is, man. It's like, even still, you know, same thing with Netflix. They came to us. A lot of people think we made the, no, I mean, they came to us. They, which is wild to this day. And and it's like, all right, well, I mean, we could have just rested on our laurels and said, Oh yeah, we have a documentary, cool, but You're grinding, man. How do you how do I how do we how do we like squeeze as much out of the toothpaste as we can? You know what I mean? And that's that's what it is. You know, you get the opportunity. How do you how do you how do you run with it? And not a lot of people can do it. You know, a lot of people they just not built for that. Did your dad share the same love for sports hockey and wrestling that you did in high school? No, nah, my dad was a football guy. You know, he um I didn't think he understood hockey at first because hockey wasn't big where we're from, you know, when we were, you know, when I was younger too. And my dad was like, hockey, you know, he wanted me to be a football guy all the way. And, uh, for, and you know, it's weird because football is an aggressive sport and I was kind of aggressive as a player with anything I played and it just didn't stick with me for some reason. And, uh, but my dad would do anything, you know, he, he just learned, I think he learned to love it at first because I was doing it wrestling you know wrestling you know he watched a little when he was younger because he would tell me stories I mean he never went to events but he would tell me stories of guys he'd watch on tv and stuff so I think he had a little more love for wrestling than hockey but as he started watching me play hockey you know my dad you know he's not going to sit back and watch so he started like really learning about it and you know he bought warm-up suits for our high school team you know that's he can't awesome. yeah. and, that, and it's it's just that's just the way he is and um you know, he just learned to, he legitimately learned the game and he learned the rules and he could tell you about it like legitimately. But he didn't stop there. He literally came home one day and said, we own a hockey team. Yeah, well, I tell well, this story, happened? listen, yeah. I've told this story a thousand times. And if you watch any time I've told it, I, I do this on purpose because it's like, you're going to hear the same story verbatim. I don't make this up. Mm -hmm. I just remember it was a Sunday. We're having, you know, uh, macaroni. My mom cooked. It's just a normal Sunday, and I'll never forget. He walked in, and I was 17, and I was halfway through my senior year of high school, and he just uh, sat down. He was at the, he was to my left, at the head of the table. We're eating, and he goes, uh, you know, he shrugs. Yeah, I'm starting a pro hockey team. And I'm just like, see, my dad, if you know him, he's a ball breaker. So he, my dad tests people. Like, he, he'll he joke with you to see how you're going to react. So I thought he was joking. So... I wasn't like, oh, dad, you're crazy. I was just like, oh, that's a great idea. I, you know, I'm like, what are you, nuts? I'm thinking like, you're nuts, you know, but I'm like, oh, that's a great idea, dad. Yeah, that's, that makes a lot of sense. And he goes, yeah, no, I'm serious. I'm, I'm you know, it's going to start in the fall and 
uh, you know, you want to run it? You're, you're going to be the president or GM or whatever? I'm like, sure. Yeah, let's let's do it. That makes so much sense. You know, I'm being sarcastic back with I'm thinking he's joking. I'm being sarcastic back. But for my dad, that's all he needed to hear. All right, that's a verbal contract now. So <laughs> two weeks later, I'm, I'm uh, you know, I walk into school and everyone's kind of looking at me weird. And I'm just like, you know, something on my back or something. You know what I mean? And um, a science teacher, I remember, came up to me. He's like, wow, this is, that, that story is insane. I'm like, what are you talking about? I thought I was dreaming. He goes, you're running a hockey team in the fall while you go to college? And I'm like, what? First of all, I wasn't even accepted to a college at that point. So I was stressed out about that. And uh, I go into the library. They got those newspapers on those big ass sticks. You know what I mean? And I'm, I'm looking and picture of my dad, picture of me. And I'm like, first of all, where they got a picture of me, I don't know. But uh, it just said, you know, my dad was bringing the team and I was going to run it. I was 17. Dude, I was like, you know, when you just get, you know, when you feel like you're not even present, like I felt like I was floating. I was like, what is like, what's going on? And um, the funniest thing of that story is we go back home. 7.30 on the dot was dinner. Like he would come in at 7.29. Like when I tell you like military, 7.29, the garage goes up. He comes in. 7.30, everyone better be at the at the table and that day it's like he sat down he looked at me I didn't say anything to him he didn't say anything to me it we're just such weirdos sometimes and I, we just sat there and looked at no one talked that whole dinner I went upstairs went to bed I'm looking at the ceiling all night and I'm like I gotta get out of this this guy is insane he really meant it and and uh I'm like what is this a joke you know I I was tossing and turning all night and I was like well Listen, my dad always said, you know, say what you mean, mean what you say. I told him I'd do it, so screw it. We got to do it, you know, and that was it. That weekend, we just sat down with a with a legal pad, started writing random stuff down. I mean, it really is, the more I think about it, it really is a weird and, and nutty story, but that's really how it started. Did you know that that wasn't normal, like for that age? Were you so, comprehending that? So, So I talked to my mother about two months ago. And we were talking and I was just like, can you believe, like, I was like, if you really look back, is this like, this is so weird, like how this story like just took off. And she said, AJ, this is not normal. Like we normalize it as a family, you know what I mean? But it's not. I look back and I'm like, she's right. It's just, it felt normal. I mean, it, and but that's just how I grew up. It was just like, if my dad wanted to do something, he he would just do it. And it was just like, my dad is a very shoot first, ask questions later type of guy. And, and I was like that a little bit. And then I started pulling back because I would see sometimes the repercussions of, you know, doing that. But my dad, if he has it in his head, that's what he's going to do. It, it's it's just a, it's a matter of when, not if, you know, he's just going to do it. And this was a defining moment for the rest yeah. of your life. I mean, like yeah. it changed you. I mean, it, it just it changed overnight because... Um, Again, I'm, I'm, I'm halfway through my senior year of high school and, and I, you know, look, I knew I was going to work with my dad uh, anyway, but my mom was like, you have to go to college. I don't care. It was just like, it was like, I had to go to college. So I hadn't gotten accepted to college yet. I kind of had a half-ass serious girlfriend. I'm stressed. And now it's like a hockey team. And it's just like, overnight it changed. You, you go from like, kind of like a regular kid to not a regular kid. And it, it was... And again, I take every, I think one of my biggest strengths is also one of my biggest weaknesses. I take everything I do super serious and to the point where I don't enjoy anything sometimes. And um, I took it very serious. I'm like, I can't let my dad down. If, I, if this screws up, I know it's going to fall on me one way or the other, you know? So it was, um, yeah, and I mean, it was, I mean, God, it, I mean, this, it's almost 20 years since that conversation. And it's like, I, I look back and I'm like, my God, that was like, it feels like a hundred years ago, but it also feels like just yesterday. It's, How did you guys come up with the name, the Danbury Trashers? That was all my father. I, I And I tell you, you know, cause he was in the trash business. And he was like, we're going to name it the Trashers. And I didn't like it at first. I'm like the Trashers. And um, I, I really didn't like it, but what am I going to do? I'm not going to tell, you know, I'm like, well, he, it's what it is. And, um, I just, I was like, I don't see it. I don't get it. I, it's not going to work. And I wasn't some marketing genius. I just was a kid, but I'm just like, you know, I, I don't see it. And then sure enough, um, this gentleman who actually lives in Danbury, who um, works at a marketing firm in, in Manhattan, was on a train. 
and he sketched what, what the Trasher logo is today. He sketched it on a train, faxed it over to my dad's office, and I just came across it. And I was like, whoa. I was like, this is it. You know, this is this is this is it. And it's uh that logo changed everything. I was like, I was all in on the name at that point. I was like, but uh, no, that was all my dad. He um he thought of the name and uh, it's an iconic name now. Now it's yeah. like it's like it's, it's a household it's name. It's the <laughs> trasher. It's just, just the funniest. It's just it's just still so bizarre. I mean, even almost twenty years later, sitting with you, it's just like the whole thing is just so bizarre to me. Now I was ten years younger than you, so I was. I was I'd, I'd see the news yeah. articles about the trashers, but I didn't fully comprehend it until yeah. I watched the the documentary. <laughs> yeah. Now there's a lot there's been a lot of hockey teams since the trashers in Danbury. Yeah. What do you think made the trashers special and so iconic that it's lived on for this long? You know what it is, Ian. I think it's a couple of things. I think people people like like you never forget your first, right? So. It's like we were the first pro hockey team in Danbury. So I think by default, people will always, you know, I hear it all the time. Oh, it's not the same. It's not like the trash. Well, good. It's better because the trashers aren't around. So it's better that it's not like the trashers right now. You know what I mean? So, but I think people just saw how authentic we were about like the passion we had behind this team. And um, it wasn't just something we were doing. It wasn't like a vanity project. You know, today, I, I have to explain to my wife, half the videos she sees are fake on social media. She's like, oh, did you see that? I'm like, yeah, that's a fake video. I'm telling you right now. We weren't doing things for clout or going, there wasn't clout or viral back then. We did things to entertain ourselves and Danbury. You know what I mean? So I think people just were like, wow, these guys are nut jobs. And they just like, we kind of catered to that like blue, uh, you know, that, that, um, blue collar crowd, but at the same time, you had doctors sitting next to felons, next to garbage guys, next to dentists. It was just like, a, those games were just like a melting pot of people in the area. And um, we also had a lot of luck go our way. You know, our first year, the Trashers, the NHL had a lockout. So a lot of the the, the upper echelon fans that only watch NHL game, they, they were fiending for hockey. So they would come down to Danbury and they were like, whoa, you know, we we knew if we could get you in the door once, you were going to be hooked. And um, you know, and you know from promoting, that's what it's about. You have you know, first impression is everything. So every game, you know, there was eighty two games a year in the season. So you're talking forty one game home games. Every forty one home games was like we had to make it feel like an event. And that's why people, I think people just saw the passion we had to you know with the product and. Um, and what made the Trashers different? Because there's a few. Well, listen, we we went in, you know, we talk about, you know, my love for wrestling. You know, I love the bad guys in wrestling. You know, as a young kid, I always, I always try to be different. I wanted to be like my dad. My dad was always trying to be different and he was different and I am different. And so every, all, all my buddies were rooting for the good guys, you know, the baby face in, in, in wrestling. I was rooting for the bad guys, you know, and I just loved everyone being mad at me that I like that I liked the bad. It was just weird. Dude, I don't drink, and to this day, people are like, why don't you just have a drink? It just, I love the fact that it, I have an Android every day. Why you have an Android? You're messing up our group chats. I love the fact that people get so pissed, like passionately pissed at me. My, my wife is so mad every day. Um, my best friend, Manny, if he's watching this, he's going to know. Every day, someone's like, why do you have a Google Pixel phone? Like, you're a loser, this and that. I love it, dude. I just always loved being different or like the bad guy. Like, and that's what we did with, we're like, we're going to make the trashers, the bad boys of hockey. And like, um, with this huge black bus. And, and when we came, it was like the circuit. I mean, we were, it was finding the biggest misfits and underdogs and like the outcasts. And we're like, we're going to stick them all together. And this is either going to be a, a catastrophe, a horrible failure, or it's just going to, all the stars are going to align and the stars align for the most part. And uh, that's what it was. We're like, we're going to be the most hated team in this league and we're going to win and the fans are going to hate us, but they're going to love us secretly. And that's what happened. And what's it like to be that young? Cause you're 17, 18 in the spotlight. You're always in the news and you're the president running this hockey team. What's that like? Again, it goes back to when I was younger. Um, I always wanted to do these things because I'm like, I love the opportunity. I want to do it. But I was also kind of like humble. about. I also was shy about it. I went to college at Manhattanville College, right? So 40 minutes away from Danbury. And um, 
you know, this is before the real true days of social media. And even back then there was MySpace. I didn't have a MySpace. I would go to, I would go to school and, um, I'd start hear rumblings. Oh, do you hear there's this minor league team and they, I swear to God. And I wouldn't say boo. No one knew except two people in my college that I was close with. Nobody even knew I was involved because I, I wasn't the type to be like, hey, I got this, I got that, come to the game. I was um very bad salesperson because no one knew what I was doing. You know what I mean? But uh it was humble, but but I had the, you know, just a lot instilled with me from a young age, being humble. I would I would know how to talk to reporters or this. And, um, you know, I would be very conscious of don't come off like a dick because um, you're going to come off as a dick regardless. I was 17. I had big chains, the fake Pearson Pagoda earrings in and, you know, triple XL basketball. I was like, I'm a dick by default with these people. I don't, you don't have to. I always wanted people to be like, oh, well, he's not as, he's not as much of a dick as he looks. And and that's really what happened with people. And and I love that because, um, you know, I look, I've always been authentically me. I didn't care what people ever said about me. But with the trashers, I kind of said, you know what? I got to I got to amp up and manufacture a bit of a personality because it's part of the team. You know, people hated all oh, this got a spoiled 17, 18 year old kid running a team. So I was like, let me go into my wrestling playbook. And I just became an obnoxious teenager in the in the suites, throwing M and M's at guys, and 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 oh, it was uh, it was a wild time. But I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna get this shit by default. I might as well, you know, enjoy it or, or amplify it and turn it into some sort of a marketing scheme, almost. And th- th- there's like such a message behind that that people will look at someone in that because I, when the, the documentary came out, I looked at the photos, the old photos of yeah. you that I've never seen before, <laughs> and then I compare that to me, and I'm like. I could understand yeah. why people have been so opinionated over yeah, you, sure. so opinionated over me. Yeah. And we as humans form opinions on that, which are yeah. usually wrong. Listen, I tell people, not everybody is racist, but everybody is prejudiced. Everybody prejudges people. Like I, I, I got stories where I could explain why I feel that way and it has nothing to do with race. It's like, I remember being in college and, um, this was right after like the Virginia Tech shootings. And so everybody was like on high guard with shootings. And you have kind of a preconception of like what a school shooter looks like, right? You know what I mean? And I remember this kid walked into the lunchroom. He had a big trench coat on, hair down to his ass. I picked up my bag. I got the hell out of Dodge. And I was like, I'm about to, I was prejudging this kid. Come to find out he was top in my class at college. And I was just like, I judged this kid based on, you know, just these preconceptions and, he ended up being the nicest kid in the world. I felt like a major asshole, but that's everybody prejudges people. It, it really makes you think when you hear stories yeah. like that. Like it yeah. just it, it changes the perspective. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I I'm telling you, I mean, um, even at the gym, people come in and I'm like right away, oh, this guy's gonna be a pain in the ass. Oh, this guy's gonna be a good guy. Could be the total opposite. We all prejudge people. And I just think, um, I just think you just got to be patient and say, listen, let me let me peel back the layers a little bit, you know, and that's that's just the reality. And I think I'm proof of that, too, because if I tell you how many people message me on Instagram, on the Trashers Instagram, oh, I hated you the first two, 10 minutes of this doc. You're a scumbag. And I'm just like, thanks. And they're like, oh, but we ended up like, oh, thank you, Bob. I mean, I appreciate you. You know what Wait, I mean? And that's like the purpose of this podcast, because you get to know the human <laughs> being behind the salacious story. Listen, you can't, it's it's impossible, you know, um, it's impossible to understand everyone because it takes time to know someone. It takes a there's not enough time in your life to get to know every person you're ever going to truly interact with. So, you know, it's, it's, um, you're not going to please everyone. And, and that's, um, just something you're going to have to, you know, learn to do, but it's, it's good that there's, you know, outlets like this podcast and, you know, other people, I think it's a, it's a huge thing for people to be able to see a different side. Yeah. Now I don't want to focus too much on the hockey aspect. Cause if anyone wants to hear that, they can go <laughs> watch the documentary, yep. but what do you think was the craziest story from your time you know, being this young kid running the Danbury Trashers hockey team. You know, we talked about this before, Ian. I'm naturally a kind of a more of a private guy. And it's weird. It's it's kind of oxymoronic because I have a documentary. But I'm still like, I'm in that mode growing up. Like, hey, you just keep your mouth shut. Don't. And I, I'm still, str- I'm getting better. But I struggle with it because there's so many stories. 
Um, there's stories I still haven't even talked about yet because I'm like, oh, statute of limitations. <laughs> or, you know, it's just, I'm weird. It's, but I don't know, man. I just, there, that's just such a loaded question because there's just so many, there's just so many stories. And um, I would just say like, like really, um, you know, a lot of the pranks, I mean, it's childish stuff, but it, you know, the pranks, you know, uh, you know, hockey's predominantly played during the winter and we we know We'd be we'd be looking at the weather forecast when it was gonna be a cold night, and you know, anonymous people would allegedly pull fire alarms at the visiting team's hotels. They'd be going out in their underwears, freezing their ass off. I mean, and it sounds like you know cheesy '90s humor, but that's how it was. I mean, we just did things in to just we had like a little core circle, and we just would be trying to outdo each other with these ideas and pranks and make each other laugh and and. I think the biggest compliment, honestly, was um, when we would have guys the second season play with us that were against us the first year. I think the greatest compliment was, man, we're so happy to be on this side now because coming to, I'll never forget this one guy said, look, we dubbed it the Danbury flu. Whenever guys were coming to play in Danbury, all of a sudden guys would be getting sick, they can't play, and, and that became a thing, the Danbury flu. Visiting teams just did not want to play in Danbury because it was just like, Something's going to happen to you or your team one way or the one way or the now other. Now on that note, you guys were known for being very violent. Yeah, so what are yeah. like what's like the craziest violent story you've heard from like the hockey aspect? I mean, uh, probably our craziest player was Brad Wingfield. He played, you know, he was actually our first signee technically and um you know, it was funny when, you know, when the adrenaline wears off after my dad says, hey, I'm bringing a team and you're going to be depressed. After all that adrenaline wears off and the reality sets in, like, okay, we we have to put a team together now. It kind of, you know, it's weird. There was no YouTube. You can't scout people. It was a different time. And no one wanted to talk to us at first because they're like, who are these guys? They're coming in, you know, with all this bravado. I got nowhere with other agents because they didn't want to deal with us. So we had a, a crazy equipment manager who's featured heavily in the doc and um he had been around the minor leagues and he said listen i don't know if he'll be available he got arrested last month but uh this guy brad wingfield's one of the he's a minor league hockey legend um I'm like why do you get in trouble and he pulled out an article he 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 beat up like three or four corrections officers in a, in a bar up in elmira new york i'm like oh we got to get this guy and uh we got him and, and he was, let me tell you something. Hockey enforcers are the sweetest guys off the ice. The greatest, like the guys you would bring around your families. That's how great they are. But on the ice, this guy, Brad Wingfield had a switch. He was built like a vending machine and he just was no finesse, just a brawler. And, and he just, uh, man, I would see him sometimes. Um, he had this little move he taught me in between your shoulder pads and your pants you have a little bit of exposed stomach and he would have this move where he gets you on the ice and when the refs are jumping on you to break it up he would pinch you so hard under your I mean he just had all these little dirty tactics and I loved him for it I was like this guy but he was a violent player man I mean um broke a guy's nose I mean you don't see it's funny in, in hockey fights you don't see brutal injuries like you'd expect but for some reason whenever he fought There'd be a delay. They'd have to, you know, scrape off the splattered blood on the ice. I mean, just a total, total savage, man. He was, he was, he was something else. Could never work this day and age, but it was fun while it lasted. Now, I had heard like things from the doc and just like rumors that you guys would encourage fights to happen. Like people would get bonuses. Sure. If, oh yeah, on the fight. chalkboard. It was first fight, five hundred dollars. You know. Oh, and these guys would be tripping over themselves to to. Uh, be the first ones to drop the glove. Now, here's the thing. What people don't understand is it's one thing to have a violent team. You know, we wanted the tough guys in this. But the the bottom line is if the other team, if guys don't want to fight, I mean, you could jump them, but it doesn't do any good. First of all, it's a weak move. And two, you're going to get a penalty and we're screwed. Because we still wanted to win, you know. So that first year, nobody really wanted anything to do with us. And uh, it was tough for a lot of the guys to find a dance partner, I guess. That second season, though, other teams were loading up with some tough guys and insurance. And the second year was actually more fun because other teams were forced to get tough guys to kind of counteract what we were doing. Yeah. Now, at the peak of this, how's your relationship with your dad? You know, it's, 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 I thought it was good. I mean, it's, it's, again, 
working father sons are are very tough to work and, and, and first of all nothing bad ever happened between us during those trasher days but it's tough because he's still your dad and he's writing the checks so at the end of the day it's 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 his stamp or there's nothing and there'd be times where I'd have ideas and he didn't see it and I'd be pissed or I'd be frustrated but what can I do and you know, you it's weird because, like, when you have a working relationship, you know, you could have a, a disagreement with someone. You go home, you sleep on it, you wake up, you're fine. I go home. You know, we we live together. So it was a weird dynamic at times. When we'd lose a game, he'd re – listen, no one in the history of sports uh, in hockey, let's say, has ever gone undefeated, 82-0. and 0. Nobody. But to my dad, we should go 82-0. and 0. So we set a single-season record as a, a – um, like a rookie franchise for the most wins and stuff like that, but still wasn't enough because we had like a, you know 14 losses. Every loss from the Danbury Ice Arena garage back home was hell. He ripped me. This guy sucks. Why is he still on the team? I get rid of him. And then the next morning, don't get rid of him. And I'm just like, I'm like what do you want me to do? So it, it's not easy at times. And, and there'd be times where um, he'd have ideas that I didn't agree with, but he's the boss and that's that's what it is. I think it's just tough when, uh, you know, I'm still living at home and you try to leave work at work, but you can't. It's, it's impossible. You go home and we're talking. My mom would pull her hair out because that's all we're talking about is hockey, 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 hockey. That was all it was. Where does your sister fall into play during this time? Is she a part My of it? My sister, so another story that no one's really told, and, and, and to me it's the most underrated story of the two seasons of the team was so our arch rivals was the Adirondack Frostbite. You know, they're up in the Adirondack, they're three hours away. And um, that was like the Red Sox to our Yankees. We hated them. They hated us. And um, after the first season, we had heard rumors that they, they were financially in trouble and, and they might fold. Now, in minor league hockey, the last thing you want is your closest rival to fold because then it puts you in jeopardy because then your next closest rival is six hours away. And then it's just... So I remember one day, I, and this, I was, I got to tell you, legitimately, I was mad at my dad. I walked into his office one day and, uh, you know, we're eating McDonald's. Dad loved McDonald's. And we're eating McDonald's and um, he goes, so I want to tell you something before you hear from anyone else. And whenever he starts with that, I'm like, oh, God. He goes, I'm probably going to buy Adirondack. And I'm like, what? You know, and like, like I, you know, it's like we hate, like hate like hated them. I'm like, what do you mean? Goes, well, and, and at the time I didn't understand the business part of it. Now I see, and it would have been beautiful. He goes, I'm going to make your sister the president of Adirondack. So I thought he was joking. And I, when I realized he was serious was when he pulled out, he had like these six styrofoam boards with new logo concepts. So he had spent money. And I was like, as a young kid, I realized I was pissed because one, my sister was going to outdo me. She was then going to become the youngest president in sports history. And that pissed me off bad. But two, it was just like, I grew up like it's either us or it's them. You know what I mean? Like, like, and I'm like, how the hell are we going to buy? Like, I hate Adirondack and this and that. He's like, well, that's what's great about it. it. You know, you and your sister will have this rivalry. And I was like, I'm going to kill my sister. You know what I mean? Like, and my <laughs> sister, you know, she's the patented little sister. I mean, she was what, 14 at the time? Yeah. I mean, I, I was like, I didn't talk to my sister for two weeks. She's like, why are you mad at me? I was like, I don't want to talk to you. You're at Adirondack. I said, dude, stay over there. I don't want to, I didn't want to eat dinner with her. It ended up, they ended up recovering on their own or whatever, thank God. But I think about, could you have imagined if, if, if that went through, that could have broke my family apart for a while. Cause I'm telling you, I was pissed. I was like, no, 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 no. Candace is not outdoing me in any capacity. Yeah. And I just said, well, fine, I'm going to, I was just like, I, I, I said, I don't even care. I would just, I would have loaded our roster with so many nut jobs just to beat up Adirondack, like even more, like it would have been bad. So, but that's just one of those stories. Like, and my sister would have done it because she liked it. She she was like, oh yeah, I'll be the youngest president of the team. I was just like, oh, I was, I was, I was hot about that, man. That was crazy. Now at this point in time, are you planning your future? Like what, what what's the future for AJ Galante look like at that age? I have no idea. Ian, to this day, I don't know what I'm doing tomorrow. Like I, it's just like, um, I get into th everything I've ever been into professionally. I, I've fallen into it. I've never planned for anything, never planned to be a, a, a hockey GM. I never planned, um, 
after my father went away and he lost the garbage. I never planned to be in the oil business, which I was for a little while. I didn't plan to get into boxing, nothing. I just, one day I wake up and I'm doing something. And I don't think that's the best advice to give someone, just wing it. But for me, it's just always how it's been. And um, yeah, but like you said, like, I, you know, when you're young and, and we were booming at the time and it's just like, you just, you never think it's going to go away. You're like, all right, well, it's trashers for life now. It's like bad boys for life. It's just, this is what I'm going to do. And um, as, as fast as we rose, we just fizzled out, you know, unfortunately. And, and that was the end of it. But there was no plan. I never got paid. You know, people thought I got paid. I, never, I didn't get paid to do my stuff with it. You know, we were, you know, the players were getting paid. My dad never got paid. I mean, um, we were just doing things, you know, and it's like. But you created a legacy. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, but man, I mean, it's like, you know, you know, I guess when you, when you see success and success is subjective, man. Some people think success is strictly money. But I look at success, like you said, a legacy thing, a landmark type of event or, you know, when you're at such height, you never think it's going to end. You're like, well, it's, I'm just going to be a hockey GM. The, you know, I figure in a few years I'll start making some money. The team, it'll turn around and work at the garbage yard half time. You know, it just, there wasn't, it was just, we'll see where it goes. And uh, like I said, it's just like as quickly as it came, it went. And um, So let's talk about the going away part. Yeah. You wake up one day and it's gone. What happens? What's like well, the my turning dad, point? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, so after our, so we only had two seasons. So after the first season, the summer of the off season, um, there was a federal raid at my dad's yard. No were indictments or arrests. It was just a raid. But you kind of know, you know, you know, something's coming down the chute. You know, they're not, they're not, they're not popping their head and showing their faces. You know to say hello, how you doing? So we kind of knew something was coming. No one kind of knew, but we knew. I was like, oh man, I hope we could get through the second season. You know, we ended up going through the second season. And um, how old were you during the raid? Uh, two, uh, nine, I, 18, and 18 years old. Were you yeah. comprehending at the time what the raid meant? Yeah, I, at a young age, I mean, you know, being younger, like my dad was very unfiltered with me, even at a young age. It's kind of funny now, you know what I mean? And, uh, you know, my dad had went away for a year and a day, you know, a year and a day sentence back when I was in eighth grade. So my dad prepared me for that as a young, you know, in sixth grade, he was like, um, there may become a time where daddy has to go away type of thing. And, and I'd be like, what do you mean? And, and I knew, you know, I just, you know, it's, Again, is this a normal thing? It was just like, all right, when the shoe drops, it drops. You know, we'll deal with it. Um, did you ever get to like talk about how you felt during that time? Like, did your mom help you? How did you get through that? Because that's a lot for someone that yeah, idolizes his it's, dad. It's, it is a lot, but it was just like, hey, daddy didn't rat. I took it like a man. And I was like, superhero to me. You know what I mean? I was like, look, that's how I grew up. And I'm not condoning i'm not saying good bad and different about people's situations everyone has to handle their situation how they have to handle it but i grew up you, you don't rat you don't you know you know uh, that's just that's been ingrained in my head now i'm not you know now you see podcast guys have it's weird to me but i'm like you know i'm not gonna judge anyone it's got nothing to do with me but it's just like when i grew you couldn't tell me this stuff would be going on in the 90s like so and so is gonna have a podcast i'd be like what like yeah but my point is, I just, um, to me, it was like, um, all right, well, I'm the man of the house for a year and a day. You know what I mean? And I'm in eighth grade. What am I doing as a man of the house? But, um, you know, it's just not, nah, we didn't really talk about it. It was just kind of like. Just another day in the life. I guess. And, you know, you, you'd make the trips on the weekends and, and um, you know, the, the first time wasn't that bad. It wasn't even that long, you know. And then the second time it was um, so Going back in 2006, you know, almost a year to when they had the initial raid, they came down with indictments. It was like 30 guys rounded up. And, um, you know, we kind of saw the writing was on the wall. Either the league was going to kick us out, you know what I mean? Or it just just wasn't going to, to work. We actually talked about, out of spite, just doing one more season. My dad was going to be on house arrest for, you know, he ended up being on house arrest two years awaiting trial and stuff. So we 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 even out of spite were thinking about doing a third season, but we're like lawyers, you know what I mean. So it was kind of like, and that was it, you know what I mean. But um, what's that feeling like when when you first found out your dad was arrested? 
I know it sounds weird or I'm trying to downplay it, but it was just, we were prepared. Like my dad, we just were prepared. You know, I was prepared for it. I think it was tougher on my sister. My dad would prepare her to an extent, but not like I was prepared for, I guess. And um, it was tough because, you know, it, it's like, you know, it's coming, but when it comes, it's, it's, you realize it's going to be disastrous one way or the other. You know what I mean? And it was a high profile case and, um, you know, good old news times every other day, something. And it was, it was kind of, um, it was sad, man. It was, um, you know, those were the days where um, you'd have news articles online and people could comment. This was before Facebook and all that. And you know, it was tough reading the, I, you know, I was always taught, don't read the comments. These are all cowards. This, but you'd read it anyway. And it was, it was sad. It kind of prepared me for trolls now. Cause um, it was something, you know, I was still young. I was still 19 going on 20 and um, it was still tough. It was still tough to endure. And, uh, but we were, we were prepared for it. I, and, and as, as, as prepared as you can be, you know, now it's not just like local cops. This is like the FBI. Yeah, and- no, no, no. It was definitely, um, it was, yeah, it was, it was a huge case, man. It was, um, and what was he exactly rested for? What was going on? Racketeering, in the um, tax stuff, you know, all that, all that. It was just, um, it's a Rico case. It was, it was, it was, it was, he was second on this chart of guys they wanted. There was someone above him allegedly. And, and you know how it works, you know, you, you, you sweep that ocean, you pick up as many fish and then, you know, everyone kind of has a mind of their own and, and they, they say, okay, who's going to cooperate? Who's going to take plea? And you know, it's, you learn the strat. you know, when I was young, I, you know, even at that time, I mean, I was, I was, um, I was always taught, you know, be, be, you know, respectful to law enforcement, you know, and, and I was to an extent, but there was times I'd get kind of pissy in front of people and I was still a young kid and, but I get it. They got a job to do. And, um, you know, you didn't understand this legal strategy, you know, at the time I was just like, if I, if someone was cooperating or, or taking a plea, it was kind of like, why'd you do that? You know, but you, you get it, you know, everyone's, you, you, you learn the legal strategies and that's what the, you know, the feds do. They want someone has set a precedent of what they're pleading to. And now it, it, that's when shit runs uphill. You know what I mean? Now it's like, that takes one card out of the equation that you're going to have to plead to if it comes to that, you know? Now on the media aspect, you guys went from, you know, idolized in the news to now yeah. like hated. How did, how, how did that feel? You know, looking back, looking back, I think the idolization or the, the, before the raid and the arrest and the indictments, I think there, you know, it was mostly positive stuff about us, but I think it was a lot of fake positive. I think looking back, I don't think it was as positive as we thought. I think there was a lot of jealous people, malicious people out there. And then when an indictment or negativity comes in, it's like, oh yeah, now we, we don't have to hide our feelings. Um, it was tough though. It, you know what was tough on me, and it was something my father couldn't understand because he wasn't in my shoes. Was um, you know, uh, when he went away, I, I I got into the oil business, and he had an old old buddy, a guy who used to work with him that started an oil company. Again, I thought I was going into garbage my whole life. I wake up one day, I have now. It's like, what do I do? Like I went to school for business management, you know. That's Did about, you graduate? Yeah, I mean, that's as generic as it gets, business management. So I'm like, what am I going to manage? You know, like, so, it, 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 and it wasn't like hockey execs were looking to hire me, you know what I mean? But so, you know, I was, you know, up until the day my dad went away, uh, October 15, 2008, um, I just remember he was, he's always looking out for me. He had an old manager at one of his garbage yards in the 90s, started an oil company, Carmel, New York got me a job. I didn't know what I was doing, but it was something. I, and um, I would go visit my dad and he'd be like, all right, well, go see this guy, this guy, this guy. They'll give you the accounts. And, uh, you know, my dad, you know, in the old days, he'd just snap and people here, his account, you know what I mean? So now I go out and you're, no one wants anything to do with you, you know? I say, hi, I'm AJ Galanti, you know, beep, bop, bop. They look at you like, oh yeah, come back in a week. or and, and then I'd have to go on visit and be like, Hey, did you see uh, Joe Blow uh, for the account? I'm like, yeah, yeah. Did you get it? No. Well, why? And in a way, I was trying to protect my dad because I know, without ever been in the prison, I knew how he must have been crawling out of his skin. You know, going from where he was 
to where he was now, it, it was like, um, I knew he'd be crawling out of his skin if I told him, hey, you know, so-and-so's just been putting me off. And I didn't want to drive him crazy. I know he was going crazy enough. So in certain senses, I was trying to protect him because I knew he, you know, the control he had to what he had now, it was just so different. And uh, I'd get reamed. He'd ream, oh, well, you're lazy. You're not doing this. You're not doing that. And I'd be like, I know I'm lazy. I'm a bum. And, you know, uh, some of the times it's, it wasn't that. It was just that no one was looking to deal with us. And then I think the hardest thing for me when he first came out, then all of a sudden, oh, AJ, why didn't you come see me? I would have gave I remember I cursed this one guy out, and I usually don't get like that because, you know, I'm always a reflection of my father, and I don't want to get anyone jammed up. I, let, I lost it, man, because it was like, I've been trying for almost 10 years to get you, and now, now, you, now you want, I mean... It is what it is. I've and that's come to all because of the situation surrounding your dad. I, I'm assuming. I mean, it has to be, you know, and then, um, you know, it's just like, uh, it's the only thing that adds up because, I mean, I was, I was like, I had the plague when he was away. No one wanted to say boo to me, be around. And, um, and only certain people understand that. Nah. Like I felt yes. what you were saying about the comments. Like I used to read all the yeah. Facebook and news You tell times. yourself you're not going to read it. I don't care what this guy says. Or that. But you're going to look. And it's heartbreaking. And then when you see people you are close with yes. in high school, yes. that shit, I mean, it drives certain people to suicide. Well, it's, it's, like, it's, it's funny. It's funny because um, back when the news times were running these articles and half of them were hit pieces. They, they weren't even, some of them weren't even factual, but that's okay. You'd read the comments and uh, it's not even, it's it's not like Ian Bick says this. It was like, you know, asshole 101 said, you know what I mean? And um, come to find out, we had an anonymous guy that was a tech guy and we found out that some of these screen names were people close to, to us and they don't even know that we know, you know, and it's kind of like, wow, I can't believe this guy or this woman said this, you know what I mean? And it's like, I've never to this day have told certain people, hey, I know that was you back in 2006. You said this, that, and the third. You know, you just kind of keep in your memory bank and, uh, you know, you go from, but it, it's it's sad because, you know, you know, um, you know, and then they're dragging your mother into it, your sister into it. They have nothing to do with anything. You know what I mean? Um, and it's, it's, it is, it's heartbreaking. It's, it's, but it toughens you up a little bit. And, um, why do you think people do that? Like they're so quick to ax people out, like they can never redeem themselves. In those Because you're not supposed to, man. You're you're a, you're you're scum of the earth now. You went to prison. Ooh, you know what I mean. And and now you're supposed to, for some reason, have that stain the rest of your. I t you know to this day there's still people that will have something to say. Um, you know even about my father. And I'm like, what is he supposed to do? So so now you know he comes out. So he's just supposed to do nothing now. Now he just has to sit. Put him in the town square and egg him every day. Like, is that what you, I mean, it's it's just, um, it's stupidity. And especially young people go away. I know plenty of young guys that go away, come out. And it's like, what are they supposed to do? They're just supposed to just live with this the rest of them. I mean, people screw up and and um, it's just, listen, my I never forget my dad's lawyer told me once. He said, AJ, they can indict a ham sandwich if they want to. It's just a matter of who they're, who they're no one's perfect, man. And uh, if they dig deep enough, we're all going to get locked up some way, one way or the other. So, Everyone has shit. I mean, it's like, it's just, it's sad, man. But again, it's, um, it, it really takes a special person, especially anonymously to comment on a, on another person's situation, especially if they have nothing to do with that person, you know, yeah. but. When did you like really realize you and your family that your dad was looking at serious time and the gravity of the situation? I would say about a year. So in 2006, he got indicted and then, you know, he, he he um he was on house arrest maybe a year later he still had another hold another year until he you know he made a, a plea deal didn't cooperate a plea deal <laughs> and i just remember like a year before he you know he had like a whole little war room downstairs in the basement it was like um he could have been a lawyer at this point he had all his you know, you're getting the 302s you're listening to all the wiretaps he's fighting for his life yeah and and it's like people don't know that like you're you're and and um it's frustrating because you just, my dad told me, I'll never forget. He goes, I actually, in a way, wish those first two years I was away and they could have credited me, you know, take it off my, being home was worse in a way, he said, because it's like, 
you're you're home, but you're not home. You're you know in what limbo, I mean? You're, yeah. you're you're you're. It's people think, oh, house arrest, great. You know what I mean? You know, and plus for some pe weaker minded people, your car's right outside. You know what I'm saying? And uh, um, but anyway, no, I just I just feel like um, you know, I'd be there a lot when the lawyers would talk to them, and and it's like, listen, you know, you know how the system's set up. You go to trial. You got a eight percent shot to get acquitted. You know what I mean? Uh, like uh, some asinine number. And um, you know, I think uh, you know. Of course, in the papers, he's looking at one hundred and fifty years. You know, when you add the maximum. So realistically, if he went to court and lost, which was very realistic, obviously with the stats, I think he was looking at like twenty five years. And it was like, how do you even fight that? I mean, why? Why? I mean, it's 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 crazy. You know, it's it's that's. And I just remember at one point he was like, you know, I'm never going to cooperate, but I'll see the best deal I can get. And it ended up being like, uh, Jesus, ended up all things considered like eight, nine years or something like that, or eight, yeah, around eight years, I want to say, you know, he didn't do the full eight, thankfully, but, um, how did that make you feel like that's your idol? That's the, person yeah, that, you that when you, you know, look, one day is a long time away. And that's another thing. People are like, Oh, you only did six months. Six months is six months. You know, most people can't do a day, but when you hear like over five years, that to me is like, Whoa, that's a, that's a, that's a pretty good number. That's a chunk of your life. You know what I mean? And, um, it was sad. It was kind of like, you know, and I still was in limbo. Now I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm graduating, you know, um, the two years he was on house arrest fighting this, I was in my last two years of college, which was hell. I just, I went to school, came back, and I just didn't want to do anything. I, you know, you go through a little bit of a depression, and uh, those were tough years. But it's kind of like the day he got to go off, it's kind of like, well, this sucks, but it's moving forward now. Now it's like, all right, let's let the countdown start at least. You know what I mean? It's it's like Christmas Eve. It's like getting there. You know what I mean? And then, you know, listen, and you know from a different perspective, but it's like then, you know, you go on visits every weekend, you go, and then eventually it just becomes normal. The new normal it's, yeah. it's just like, all right, well. Did you and your sister get closer over this traumatic situation? Well, she would never drive. I'd always have to drive. So she was always sleeping in the back. But yeah, no, we, I think we definitely did. Like I you think, guys were there for yeah, each other. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, you know, we were there and, uh, you know, it's, it's, we, we didn't miss a visit, you know, it was, uh, so what's visiting like in, in federal prison? Visiting is funny where we were in Allenwood, uh, you know, there was, a there was a lot of high profile guys there, people that I've heard word of mouth through the years. There was a lot of different characters over there. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things that you wait and, you know, it's, it's, it's whatever. Listen, the front desk, it's like, it's like a video game. If you could get through the front desk at the bottom floor, you're going to make it. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, you know, the strict dress code, especially for women. And, you know, it's whatever mood they're in. You know what I mean? You go in some days and it's, oh, hello, Mr. Galanti. Uh, hello, this and that. Then some days you get there. Oh, there's like a half a millimeter of your stomach showing. You can't come in. There was a Walmart down the street women would have to go to Walmart, buy new shoes, buy, sh you know what I mean? Like they were like, uh, it's, but if you could get through that first checkpoint, you're going to, you're going to make it up there. And then uh, in Allenwood, you know, you go through, you'd stamp your hand, you go through, you know, like seven checkpoints and you'd go up a hill and, you know, um, you'd go in and, you know, they had like a, reminded me of like a high school, uh, cafeteria just all the chairs and the vending machines and everything and then it was just like in my in my situation it was like flip a coin my dad's coming in it's going to be a hilarious funny visit laughs and or it's going to be it's not going to be a good visit because of his mood yeah it was like it was like um well even before prison my dad will dictate the pace of wherever things are going to go you know he's going to dictate the mood the pace of things but you know, with my dad and, and, and we had a different, we still have a different relationship than most father son. And it was just like, ah, oh God, what, what's he coming out with? And, uh, he come in and sometimes he'd have a smirk or he'd be ball breaking with one of the guys. And then some days you come in, he go check in and I'm like, oh, this is going to be a long six to eight hours. This is going to be, this is going to be a bad one. So it's, did, it's, it was, it's Russian roulette, bro. That's what, that's what it was. Did he ask you to get him stuff from the vending machine? Cause that's always like so, big. So yeah, no, no, no. So you get there. My oh God, my mom would want to wake up five in the morning. Let's get there early. We get up there and, and you know, you know, a few times we were the first, first people there. 
and we'd go in and he, my dad's got a sweet tooth. So cupcakes, uh, Reese's, Snickers, you know, we'd load up like I, and um, they had like a refrigerated vending machine with wings and like ham and, and it got to the point where I actually enjoyed these wings. I'd get out of the vending machine. That was like a treat for me. I was like, that's how you know you're kind of losing it even as a visitor. And uh, yeah, you'd, you'd like to have it ready for him, you know, depending on, especially if he was in a bad mood, you'd like to just try to give him a hostess or something like, hey, you know, here's a cupcake. But yeah, no, no, vending machines are, uh, you know. Vend it's yeah, like a vacation for us, like uh, us inmates, like to get that. Yeah, and, and, and that's, what it, that's what it was. I mean, he, my dad loves snacks, bro. I mean, he loves it. And uh, as mad as he would be, take a Snickers, rip it, eat it. Mm -hmm. You know, he'd be, he'd be all right. Or hot chocolate. He loves hot chocolate. The hot chocolate machine was down. It was something. It was, it was, it was, dude, it was a lot of pressure, man. It wasn't ever fun. It wasn't like, oh, I get to go see my dad. I loved it. I, I, I was happy to see my dad, but it was, it was a lot of pressure because I was going to get reamed. I used to take a lot of brunt of the frustration. Um, and uh, hey, that's just, it is what it is. Now, what I've noticed about you is you're someone that always pays attention to like the room and your surroundings. Yeah what are you seeing like in the visiting room, like with other people interacting with yeah, women and men? Yeah, yeah, it's 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 funny because it's like, you know, your first time there, you're the newbie, right? So it's like, you don't know how to act. You don't know what you're supposed to do. Then again, it comes normal. Then you, you'd always like, I'd always, when I was waiting for him to come in, I'd always look around and see who the new person was because I could tell just by how they were acting, like waiting or, you know what I mean? You're not supposed to touch each other. You know, the women would be coming and I'd always know when it was a new woman, they'd be dressed like they're going to the club. And I'm like, oh man, this woman's not getting through. Got perfume up the yin yang. I'm like, oh my God, this woman has no idea what's coming. Sure enough, now nah, you can't come in, go to Walmart, get some shoes or, you know. But uh, no, you, you meet. You you meet these guys. You 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 be, you know you start meeting family. You start seeing the same people. You start seeing the regulars, and you know you start getting accepted by the regulars when they see you start coming in. And and because uh, you're all bonding yeah, over the same thing. Yeah, you meet people yeah. at the vending machine. Oh, Pete, how you doing? You know, how was your week? You know, it's it's crazy, bro. It's crazy how those dark times bring people together, yeah, though. Because. There's only so many people that, you know, especially currently, like if you have a loved one away, there's only so many people that can truly understand how it feels. And, you know, but my dad was, um, my dad loves um, breaking balls and he'd be in there and, you know, he'd, he'd like spitball someone real quick. I'm like, in the visiting room? Yeah. Sometimes oh, he'd be like, he'd be like, <laughs> like, are you crazy? And then, and then, uh, but I tell you the funny the funny story I was telling you before is I gotta say this was probably 2009. I'm 20. I'm going on 23, and uh, I just got out of a you know long relationship. I was between my dad going away, losing the trash. So I had a long time high school girl. I thought that was gonna be the you know my wife, and I'm just I'm going through it. And my dad, you know, he's this was before core links and email, so he was writing me letters. Hey, don't worry about it. Blah blah blah. And, I remember one day I'm at visit, and I never told this story. If my wife's listening, I love you. You're the only woman for me. All right, so I'm in visit. I'm, you know, this is God, 15 years ago or so. I'm in visit, and I know it's a cute girl, you know, pretty decent looking girl. I never seen her before. Because again, I'm looking around who's here, who's coming out, and um, I see a you know, kind of cute girl. I'm like, all right. So my dad comes, and again. Even, you know, I'm a visitor, you know, but I know, you know, you're not, you know, don't keep staring at people. I'm not trying to cause any, you know, I don't know if it's someone's wife or daughter or girl. I don't know who I'm. So my dad notices me keep kind of like, you know, looking and looking. And he's like, and he's like, oh, what? What are you looking at? I was like, no, none. He goes, oh, you like that girl? You want me to set it up? I'm like, no, no, like, no, I'm just. He's like, no, no, I know the guy. I'll tell I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm like, no, no, dad, really, no, no, no. No, 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 I'm going to take care of this for you, you know. You need to get out there, meet a nice girl or something. I'm like, no, no, dad, for real, no, no, no. Okay, okay. So, <laughs> sure enough, no no BS, I get a letter in the mail. Again, the, halfway through my dad's sentence, it turned into emails and core links. But I get a mail, I open it, and um, there's like a school picture in it. And I'm reading the letter. He's like, hey, AJ, this is the girl you were looking at. I know, I don't want to say the name. Uh, this is, uh, you know, Beep Bop Bop's daughter. 
I gave him your him the number to give to her. I'm like, first of all, the first thing I noticed was I told him don't do it. He did it anyway, which I had a weird feeling. But I'm looking at the picture. That's not the girl. It's not the girl I was looking at. You know what I'm saying? And again, the girl wasn't, I'm not saying the girl was ugly, but it wasn't the girl I was looking at at visit. And I'm like, oh my God. I was like, I was like, and I don't want to be rude. Like, sure enough, I swear to God, it was like, this was like planned like this. Like two days later, I get an email from this girl. She's from the tri-state area. And, uh, oh my, uh, you know, I hear we have someone that's something in common. He, he, he. And I'm just like, and I'm looking, and again, again, she she wasn't an ugly, she was an attractive girl, wasn't an ugly girl, but not necessarily my type. So I'm like, I cannot believe I'm, I, my dad couldn't get this right either. Like, I, that's not the girl I was looking at. But I'm not going to be like, you know, F off and she tells her dad and it becomes a thing. So now I'm like, now I got to entertain. I'm like, I got to entertain this girl. So I'm like, hey, how you doing? Blah, blah, blah. And she's like, are you going? And she'd become very clingy, bro. Like, are you going this weekend? And I'm like, ah, Christ. I'm like, yeah. And um, we end up, so, so my, I, go to, I go to visit. She's there. I go to vending machine. She goes to the vending machine. Hey, how are you? I'm like, oh, good, good, good. Oh, my God. I go to visit. My dad comes out with this grin. And like, he's just like played matchmaker. I'm like, it's like, what's the matter? I was like, dad, I was like. She's a nice girl, but that's not the girl I was looking at. Well, who were you looking at? I don't know. I don't, I'm not in there. I don't know who it was. Oh, she's a nice girl. What are you worried about? I was like, he was like, he was like, <laughs> so I'm just like, and I know who the daughter, I know who her father was. So I'm like, I'm not going to ever be disrespectful. So I'm like, I got to entertain this girl now because of this. So, so sure enough, I go up to the vending machine. She goes up to the vending machine. I'm like, oh, Ming, like this girl. She's like, hey, uh, do you want to meet next week? You want to meet in the city for dinner or something like that? I'm like, sure. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, all right, sure, let's do it. And I'm like, oh, my God. And and again, it wasn't her fault. I was going through a lot. She was a nice girl, but it was just not a right situation for me. So sure enough, she emailed me, you know, and I met her in the city. We go get pizza, and I'm just like, oh, my God, this is crazy. And she's like sitting next to me. She's like, like hugging on me. And I, and I, and again, I, I'm, in case anyone's watching, the internet's big. She was a very nice girl. She's probably a great girl now. Hope she's happy, but it wasn't for me. And, and she's just hugging on me. And, and I'm just like, I gotta go. And, and, and she's like, oh, you wanna come back to the house? I'm like, no, 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 no. And then, um, and I'm, just, I'm like, dad, I was like, I'm letting you know now. If it, <laughs> I'm like, I gotta cut this. I can't do this. He's like, well, you got to keep entertaining her for at least two months. I was like, no, I can't. I can't do that. I was like, we're like making a deal. Like, all right, a month. She's like, all right, all right, a month. And then luckily that gentleman ends up getting transferred. I don't know where. And I was just like, oh, my God, thank God. And never saw the girl again. And Finding uh, love at the prison vending machine. Yes, and sir. if you married her. So you want to hear something funny? True story. My wife, my wife, Kimberly, yeah. the only girl for me. Her father did 10 plus years, did a stint in Allenwood the same time as my father. We never saw each other. She's from Danbury. Do they know each other? Uh, they, when they got out, when I started dating my wife, we started talking and, oh, my dad was away. She's like, oh, my dad was away too. I was like, oh, okay. It's like, where do you go? Uh, a couple places, uh, Allenwood. I was like, what? I was like, my dad was in Allenwood. What years? They they knew of each other. like then when we got married they're like oh yeah I know him from you know <laughs> you know what I mean and uh, crazy That's My, and we probably and she went every weekend we probably for all I know that was the girl I was looking at at the visit that I wanted to meet and my dad hooked me up with you know someone else do you think you guys were drawn to each other because of that shared experience I don't know but I, I she's very similar to me in personality and 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 she's very super humble and respectful and would always, you know, always write back to her. You know, she's just, you know, you know, some people, it's weird. I would hear horror stories about guys who families want nothing to do with them. And again, I don't judge. I don't, you know, mm. but it's like, man, that's got to be torture, you know? And then it's like, we would always make, and then when Core Links came, you know, we'd be emailing. Oh, God, I remember Core Links. Yeah, and, how uh, does prison emailing work? Can you explain that from like an outside Yeah, like, so I remember one day I went to visit and he's like, hey, we're getting emails. And I was like, what? <laughs> My dad's a funny guy. He goes, hey, we're getting email soon. I said, oh, yeah? He goes, yeah. He goes, in the rec room, they put this, uh, 
you know, they got the phones, but now they got these like computers. I was like, oh yeah? My dad doesn't know how to type. My dad never had a computer, like in his, you know? So I'm picturing him going like, you know, typing. I was like, you sure? Like, it'd be faster to write a letter. He's like, all right, wise ass. I'll have someone type it for me, this and that. So you'd get a notification like, hey, you know, you'd see core links and uh, it would be like, AJ, it's dad. Like, I don't know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I don't know it's it's my dad. So then you'd have to log in. There was a whole lot. And then, uh, you know, we'd, we'd go back and forth all day sometimes. You know what I mean? But it was funny. His subject line was always, AJ, it's dad. That's funny. Now, when you went to visit him, are yeah. you curious about like what's going on? Do you ask him and does he- No, I never ask him. He, 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 he that's just growing up. Like I never ask him questions. Sometimes he'll tell me things. Sometimes he does, but I never, I never would ask, Hey, what's, you know, what'd you eat today? You know what I mean? Like, Hey, I was, were you curious? Oh, sure. Of course. But I just, it was just so ingrained in me. You just don't ask questions. I just would never ask. And, uh, but he would, you know, you know, as he got in there, as years gone by, um, he'd be like, Oh, uh, I got this kid. He lives in Connecticut. He's coming out soon. I told him you'd into boxing. He, you know, and you know, guys in prison, there's a lot of stories. You know, he was a huge boxer, huge boxer. You got to sign him. I'm like, all right. I was, and, and, and she, my, my dad would give my number out all willy nilly. I'd be getting calls from guys, hey, you know, this and that. And, you know, again, you've got to do the right thing because I don't know if it's going to get back to him if I'm ignoring a guy or this and that, but it's characters, man. You know, it probably kept your dad going though. Yeah, oh yeah. I would meet a lot of guys that are so proud of like their kid. And, oh. This and that, that he probably would, um, helped him more than you knew. Yeah, and I think, uh, yeah, I think, you know, listen, and I could tell without him telling me, I could tell like some of the stuff he was doing, whether he was in a law library and, you know, um, this or this, I know it was him, you know, he was finding a rhythm, he was finding, you know, you he would make lemons out of, you know, lemonade out of lemons, you know what I mean? He'll find, you know, and you gotta find something, you know, and that's what he would always tell me. He's like, look, I wake up, I walk, you know, I do my thing and, and um, meet with the guys. I sit and watch them play basketball. He didn't play, but, you know, he, you, know, you just, like you said, you just find a way. Same thing on visits. You have the place you sit, you know, and you kind of have like your place. And it's weird. It just, it just happens so naturally. It's not like you're like, hey, this is my table. Yeah. You know, you just go and it's kind of like, all right. Like you see the regulars and everyone kind of knows where everyone is. And it's, it's, it's weird. It's, it's its own little world. It's, it's a whole different, it's, it's a, and it's like a lot of things are just unsaid. You just know, you know what I mean? Like they had a nice little outdoor patio. For visits, But yeah. my dad would never want it. No, I'm not going out there. So-and-so is out there. I don't, I don't want to go. You know? I mean, I was like that the same way. And I think our visitors don't understand that. And yeah. I mean, like for so long, I didn't like talk about prison. Yeah. So like, I understand your dad. No, and I always would tell, like, I would always tell, you know, it was always so when we would leave, my mom and sister would cry almost every time. And I'd say, look, everything's all right. It's it's gonna be okay. And and uh, even when there was some frustrations from the family, and I'd be like, you guys don't know what he's going through. I don't know what he's going, but no one knows. So you know, we got to be patient because, I mean, this is this is a tough situation. And uh, but uh, no, visits were tough, man. Because I tell you, when he was hot about something, I would get it, and it was not fun. And it was like then you you'd get reamed. Five hours and 59 minutes, the last minute. Hey, I love you. Bye. <laughs> then I'd have to drive three and a half hours. Like, <laughs> it, was just, it was just yeah, wacky times, man. Now, do you think like from your perspective, watching like content like mine, say, helps you understand what like a loved one's going through in, in, in that scenario? Absolutely. I think what you do, not blowing smoke, I think it's great because- Listen, it's funny, you know, growing up, I would know guys that were in prison came out and this, and this, it's almost like, um, it's a badge of honor in a way to, you know, for you, because I think as men, we all wonder, could I make it in prison? Like, I think at a young age, at least, I don't know what this generation is like nowadays, but I remember growing up, it was kind of like, man, could like prison, that's, that's some serious shit. Like, I think every boy Every man has always said, like, oh, could I survive? You know what I mean? Like, could I do it? And then when you know a guy that's gone and come out, it's kind of like, man, you know, Ian did, you know, he took his time like a man. I don't care if it's a day in a camp or 10 days or 10 years in a max. It's like there's something to that. And I, it's like um, it's good to get the perspective. Like my dad never wanted us to come on holidays. Um, he had a thing like holidays, Thanksgiving and Christmas. He didn't want anything a week up to it and I'm like 
He was like, I, it's just too hard for me right now. He goes, I don't want, it's tough. My dad loves the holidays. My dad loves Thanksgiving and Christmas. And, um, you know, you would think you'd want to see us. And at first I was like, what, does he not want to see us? But I realized it was just too hard. You know what I mean? And, and um, you know, we're home with a fire going, eating nice, and he's, you know, eating friggin' whatever. And uh, I realized as as time went on, I was like, I understand it. My mom took that heart. It's like, why, what do you mean? You don't want to see us around Christmas? Nah, just come like beginning of December and don't worry about it. But I get it. You know, I, I can, I can, I can't imagine. I hope I don't have to experience it, but uh, I, I can't imagine what, what holidays were like, you know? While he was away, were you thinking of like going to work a nine to five? Like, what were you thinking of your life? You, you must have been a little bit unhappy with where you were at to go well, from top he, of the world to this. Yeah. I mean, I definitely thought at one point I was top of the world. And then it was kind of like, you know, I did kind of, you know, with the oil company, it was kind of a quasi nine to five job. And um, listen, I was okay with it. You know, I was like, you know what? You know, I had enough of the rush and, you know, living on this little pedestal. And I don't mind living a regular, quote, regular life. Regular, I, I'd kill for a regular life right now. You know, guys that, but I just don't think I'm built for it. I'm always in the mix with something. And it's not like I, I do it for any other reason other than that's just how I'm built. You know, I'm Your just- Your brain's always churning. Always, always. And, and you know, like, and I catch myself, you see? Like, I, sometimes it's hard to look at people in the eye and that's my dad's fault and I'll tell you why. But I'm always thinking, like it, it never, and it's it's a gift and a curse because I, I can't turn it off. At home, I'm just like thinking, what can I do? What can I do? But I have trouble looking people now because of my dad, because growing up, whenever I get yelled at, um, you know, I had a, like a nervous little giggle or laugh and my dad would be screaming, screaming like a maniac. And um, he'd be like, look at me in the face when I, when I talk to you. And I look at him and he goes, oh, you staring at me? There? What, you think you're bad? You want to you wanna swing on me or something? I'm like, I don't know. Do I look at you? Do I not? So... I got this thing where we're looking at Pete. It's it's funny, but um, yeah, but like the brain churning never part, stops. Like, I, I feel that because that's me. Like I'll be in never. the moment and I'll be so happy, but I'm thinking of like what's next. Like you're with some, you're with a girl, it's, you're with a project, anything. What, what's next? Yeah, and I, and I try really hard. I really try to have some like even if it's an hour to just turn off, but it's impossible with the phones. It's impossible. It's not. I tell my dad all the time, you guys had it easy back in the day in certain respects. You go home and you know, that's pretty much it. You don't text messages, social media, you need content, you need to post, am I falling behind? Where's my followers? It's like, dude, it's like, and, and, and you're, you know, obviously we all have teams, but at the same time, like we're the type of guys where we're hands on, we're doing it. Like, you have to be. And, and it's like, you, it's never off. And it's like, it's kind of sad in a way sometimes, but- I just think guys like us, like we just some people are just built for that. And um, I know I can handle it. It's not easy, but I know I can I can do it. But you know, AJ, when I think about it, I wouldn't have it any other way. Like no. I think about where I was a year no, ago working yeah. at Whole Foods and I love this shit, man. Like I love the grind. I it's love the, doing it's the it, you know what it is, man? It's it's embrace the chase. It's like a big you know, you see people go hunting, they they take pictures with these bears and friggin' deers or whatever, and you're like, you know, that's not my thing, but it's like that's what we we're hunting. It's it's a, sometimes you don't even know what you're looking for, but it's it's like a grind, the hunt. Um, you know, it's that chase, and, and sometimes there's no like you don't really have an end game. Sometimes it's just sometimes it's just what what are you gonna pass on this road? You know what I mean? And that's a lot what I deal with, man. It's like I I end up in things where I'm like, how the hell did I end up doing this? And it's just just is what it is. What was it like when your dad got out of jail, like in the community with your family, your relationship with him? It was, uh, you know, it was a long stretch. I think, um, I think it was tough for all of us. You know, my dad's my, I look at my dad as my boss, even now. I mean, if, if he says to do something, I'm going to do it, whether I agree or not. That's just how it is. But I think it was different this time around. A lot of time went by, even though we saw each other weekly, basically, you know, he came out and, um, listen, we all aged. You know, I, he came out, how old was I? I mean, I was you know, late 20s. My sister's a grown woman now, you know? And I think, um, you know, the world didn't stop. Technology, cell phones, smartphones. He's like, what the hell is this? You know what I mean? And, and, and it's true. It's like, you, you know, when, he got an, I, when he got a smartphone like two years ago, I thought hell froze over. You know what I mean? It was like, you know what I mean? Like, we used to have Nextels, you know? So... It was just, um, I think it was tough transition for all of us because 
you know, even though I look at my dad as my father and, you know, boss or whatever you want to call it, I, you know, my, my partner or whatever, it, it's, I'm still a grown man now. And it's like, sometimes I feel like he still sees us as 15, 14, 12, but I, you know, I don't know. It was, it was tough transition. I think same thing. My dad, my dad's funny. He, you know, before he came out, like two months before, he's like, you know, I just want to go home. I want to lay back. I'll come to the oil company. I don't want to do anything. I want to sweep the floors. I do. It's bullshit. My dad. My dad is a is a. Um, my dad is a leader and and an alpha man. He is not coming and sweeping floors or or. Um, not that he's afraid. My dad gets up. My dad's seventy years old. He gets up four a.m. He's on the oil truck pulling yeah. a. My like, dad. You know. Not. He's just. He is just built different and. Um, I hope at 70 I'm not doing that. But you know what? I'm realizing more and more I probably will be doing something at 70. Like I just It's in your blood. It's just us, yeah. you know? And but my dad is um he's a dog, man. He's uh but it's funny. He kept convincing people, no, no, it's gonna when I come out, it's gonna be different. I'm gonna just like, okay, sure. And he comes out, the minute his foot hits the door, he's he's wants to buy an oil truck, wants to do that, you know, and I'm like, oh my God. And it was um I think that's a natural thing for guys. I, I know a lot of guys who came out and it's kind of like you want to make up for time. And it's you're watching from the outside and you're like, dude, relax. But at the same time, you're like, you know, you don't know what it's like. I know I couldn't imagine if I was away eight years or so and then I came out. I mean, I'm if I'm away from my gym for two days, I'm like crawling out of my skin. So I, I cannot... It just it's just all perspective, man. Were you like walking on eggshells to try to help him adjust? Sure, sure. I mean... um, I think the toughest thing for me was what we said earlier is then all of a sudden everyone wanted to be my friend again or be, and I, I was just like, and again, you know, I kind of feel like a cage zoo animal sometimes. Cause it's like, I always grew up. My dad's like, don't ever do anything disrespectful to people. Don't, you know, you know, your reflection of me, your reflection of the family, you know, don't get yourself jammed up. People look at you differently. If you spit out the window, you're going to get arrested. Like I always had, so I would always be respectful. Even if I disagreed with someone or didn't like someone, I'd always be overly respectful to people. But um, I'll never forget this one guy all of a sudden. He making me look stupid in front of my dad, you know? Oh, why, AJ, you're, why didn't you come see me years ago? I would have gave you the account, and I just, I lost it, dude. I'm like, are yeah. you crazy? I came to you 10 times. I saw you in the window. Your secretary said you weren't here. You know what I mean? It's like- um, But that's like all the people that reached out when Netflix did yours, when HBO oh, did yeah, mine. Like yeah, it just yeah. People... Then all of a sudden it's, but again, I, I was primed and prepped for, you know, when the documentary came out, I think I was just primed and prepped for, I've seen all that stuff before. So it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't bother me as much. And but, it makes um, you tougher and it's like time heals everything, but yeah. it doesn't for the person affected by no, it. No, it, it, it does. It's just all band-aids and, um, you know, some band-aids are more Unless you really than work through the yeah, shit. And, uh, but it's, it's just, just some stuff, some people's um, circumstances it sticks, it sticks with you forever and it's... Uh, I think you got to kind of pick and choose, all right, what problems can I work through? What can I just deal with? You know what I mean? It's like cancer. Some people have cancer and it's there. It's like, all right, well, chemo's not helping me. How am I just going to live? Like, how do I make the most of it? And that's certain circumstances. Is It's like that. It's like um, there's things that I've gone through that I know that I won't um, fully get over. But, you know, you just you got to choose what you want to do with it. Now, when your dad went away to prison, how did like your home lifestyle change? Like financially, was it, did you guys live the same way you did before? Uh, to an extent, sure. I mean, you know, what's funny is, uh, you know, my dad had a very successful company, crazy successful, but we still, I mean, we had things, but we weren't, you know, my dad's weakness was cars. He always had a nice car, but we had a nice house, nice cars, but I mean, I see people with less money living a lot more extravagant. You know what I mean? Vacations every other week. And it might, we weren't like that, man. I mean, it was just like um, my my family, my, my dad, and I'm just like, we don't drink, we don't smoke, nothing. You know, so it was kind of like nothing really. Ch I mean, we were lucky in a sense that, um, you know, we still had food on the table. We still had the house. Obviously, we didn't lose the house, thank God. Um, it was pretty public record that he got to keep some money. Too. Yeah, yeah. No, he was, you know, and that was part of, you know, he had a good lawyer, good part of the plea. And, and you know, thankfully, we you know, we didn't lose the house. Um, you know, lost a lot of money, obviously. I mean, um, before my dad got indicted, I believe that his company was appraised at like $120 million dollars. You know, the, the agents took it over after the indictment and sold it for nine and a half million dollars. So it's like, 
Oh man, it's a, it's just like it's you can't let those numbers mess with you because it's kind of like oh if I sold it a year earlier I could have had a hundred and something you know but you can't think like that. That's like the stock market. Oh, you can't, that. you can't. But it'll drive you crazy. And I knowing my dad, I'm sure it crosses his mind every once in a while. Yeah. Now, during the time of like him getting out and you guys rebuilding your relationship, you were able to put your energy into a new project. You came yeah. on to boxing. Yeah, I mean, you talk about another random, I mean, I wasn't a boxing fan growing up. I never boxed. I don't box now. Um, it was just, uh, the short end of the story, how I got involved with it was um, my barber at the time, who's not my barber anymore, but my barber at the time was singing the blues to me one day. It was 2011, and he's like, oh, my car, and you know, and... I know when people are efficient and I'm like, this guy think I'm going to buy him a car or something? You know what I mean? Like, I'm like, is this guy insane? Oh, do you think you could co-sign for me? And I'm like, this guy's really lost his mind. So I'm like, and I'm thinking about it as he's, you know, got a razor to my face in a way. I'm like, let's wait till after he edges me up to tell him I'm not doing it. You know what I mean? And, uh, but I'm a sucker. And I'm like, I see this guy every week. Sometimes I go to the barbershop almost every week, you know? I'm like, I see this guy more than family. You know what I mean? And and I'm such a sucker, bro, that I'm like, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I said, I'll give you a down payment. You pay me back weekly plus free haircuts until it's paid type of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He ends up buying a car um, from a used car dealer that happened to be um, Fernelli Feliz Sr., who was an ex-heavyweight boxer in Danbury. Never knew Fernelli. Um, Big guy, strong, and... Um, Hey, you know, here's this guy's money. Thank you. Shook hands. That was that was our interaction. I thought I'd never see this guy again. You know, like two days later, I get a call from uh, Fernelli, and, he, and I was like, I was like, don't tell me this guy jerked him around with, the, like, don't tell me this barber jerked him around with something with the car. I'm like, I'm like, what? Do I, I don't. He goes, uh, Hey, champ, you ever uh, get into boxing? I'm like, What? I was like, What's this guy talking? I didn't know he was a boxer. He goes, You know, I used to box and. I'm working with a boxer. He's a local guy and he's on, you know, he's he's trying to revive his career and and have you ever been a boxing manager and I'm like, "What? I, I don't know what a boxer." Ian, long story short, a week later, I'm this guy's manager, uh the boxer and uh I'm going to meet promoters, I'm making deals and I'm like, "What the hell is going on?" But what happened was I realized this was just reigniting something I've lost with the trashers. Just, the flame just, inside. The competitiveness, yeah. the rush, the, 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 how in boxing, how I was able to just come in and be a manager. Like you, I can't tomorrow be like, I'm an NFL agent. You know, I can't just wake up and be like, hey, you know what? I'm an NFL agent, sign with me. Dude, boxing is nuts, bro. And then like my obsessive personality, it went from wanting to manage one fighter to, now I want two guys. Now I want three guys. Then it was like, maybe we get a gym. You know what I mean? And I've been in boxing now 13, almost 13 years. And Champs Boxing Club, our gym, uh, is Yeah, you opened a old. gym in Danbury. Yeah. I mean, there was no... And you know what? I like doing things from the ground floor. I mean, there's been boxers from Danbury, but Danbury's not a boxing town. It wasn't when I got into it. So I'm like, how do we make this a culture thing here? You know, just like we did with the Trashers. I mean... Danbury is a major hockey hub right now um, in the Northeast. It's like a culture. And, you know, I like to say the Trashers was a big part of building that culture. So I'm like, how do we create a culture of boxing in uh, Danbury? And we, we, Fernelli showed me this spot, it ended up being champs. And, and, and his sons are both professional. Yeah, boxers. his son is a professional. And his other, his youngest son is um, the alternate for the Olympics right now. So we went from this little, random little gym in Danbury, Connecticut to now there's people relocating to Danbury to train here. And it's like such a humbling thing. And uh, it's a big team effort. And uh, we got great coaches, as you know. I mean, how much are you weighing now? You're going to be the next <laughs> middleweight champ of the world at this point. I'm, I mean, uh, uh, I'm 190. Yeah. So you're, yeah. you're, you're working down to, to light heavy. And, uh, but I mean, it's just like, um, to be able to connect with people and, and give people something, because especially the kids, that's where I get the most joy is, um, you know, growing up as a wrestling fan, you know, you see a ring when you walk in, like the first thing I want to do is jump off the top rope, you know what I mean? And when kids see it, they get excited, you know, and um, it's my baby, you know what I mean? It's like, it's like, it's not, you know, for some people it may not be a lot, but for me, it's like, that's everything. That, that gym is, uh, 
you know, it's, it's, it's home and it's, it's, it's home for so many people and the type of people I grew up around, you know, I mean, that's, uh, you just got such a mix of people in there, you know, and, and everyone's a team, you know, you got, you got, uh, guys with checkered pass in there with, with, with doctors and lawyers and, and, and garbage men. And it was just like, it just all seems to come full circle, you know, it's, um, but it's a lot of work because I don't, you know, I don't rest on just, oh, we got a gym. Cool. Like, how do we take it to that next, like, yeah. keep doing it? And, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's been um, a huge part. I met my wife there, you know. Oh, you I met her at the gym. Met her at the gym. She, uh, she brought her two nephews and um, come to find out she used her two nephews to meet me because <laughs> she did contact me first on DM. So mm-hmm. she slid in my DMs first, but she did come to the gym and, uh. It was, I guess, love at first sight at the gym. We got married at the gym during COVID. Really? Um, we were set to get married May 2nd, 2020, which we ultimately did. But because of COVID, we had to push back the wedding ceremony. And I was like, you know what? Why change the date? We got married in the ring uh, with the you know Mayor Bouton at the time and uh, got married during COVID and had the wedding a year later. Crazy. And, and you know, that's about the time I first started meeting you because HBO filmed the sure, scene. Yeah. And boxing has been like... More recently, now that we're training a lot heavier yeah. and we're, we're trying to get me to that next level, sure. it's like it's therapeutic and like I relate to it in so many levels. It's a good like with my mind's running at a million miles. I wish it. I wish champs was around when I was younger because it would have been something even you know because I was very aggressive when I played sports and you know mental health is so big now you know especially in schools and and I'm telling you boxing training you don't have to have any contact. See, the mothers get nervous. My mother every week, do you make sure the mothers know they're not fighting? I'm like, I know. But people don't realize like the non-contact training of boxing, it's like you said, for when people do it for the first time, I'm like, oh man, I love this. And um, same thing, when we get people through the door, it's um, very rare we lose them. And uh, we, and you know, you've become part of the family there. And it's like, um, it's just like a big family over there. Lots, lots of action. There's pros, there's amateurs, there's random people. And um, and nobody cares what's outside the door. Nah, like everyone's there to like- It's its you know. own domain. It's like, um, you know, it's like when I used to go on White Street where my dad's, you know, that garbage yard is still there. It's not him obviously, but- Look, you when you went those gates, it was like another city. It was like its own rules and laws, kind of like prison. You know, it's a whole nother, you know, when we, you went to AWD, it was like a whole nother world. And uh, same thing with champs in a way. You know, it's a, it's, it's our own little community. And um, and I love that it represents the underdog because that's, that's how, all what I about. relate that's to. That's all. I just want to deal with underdogs. I don't... Um, because we are underdogs in 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 the realm of boxing, Danbury, Connecticut. Like, who the hell's from Danbury? You know, but we're the underdog. When people see us, um, it's like, whoa, you know, they're they're making moves now, and I love it. When I like it, it's got to be gritty, not pretty. You know, I want guys that are dogs and and guys that just care. And um, we got a good cast of characters over there. Yeah. Now, do you think starting champs and what you've been able to build helped give you peace from your past of the trashers and what you lost? Yeah, I think you know it's funny. Before the documentary came about, um, I didn't. After we lost the Trashers, I didn't want to talk about the Trashers. I didn't want to. Um, I didn't want to. I didn't even watch hockey. I, I wanted, and that was a huge part of my life. Hockey. I didn't watch. I didn't want to. When boxing came, I wasn't even thinking about the Trashers. I kind of put two and two together. Hey, I'm, I got something back that I lost, but I would never say the word Trashers. And of course, people every once in a while, hey, can you tell us about that? I'm like, I don't want to. You know, it's funny. It's like um, Seinfeld's my favorite show of all time. But I heard if you ask like George Costanza about being George, he hates it. He doesn't <laughs> want to talk. That's how I felt. And then um, when the documentary came about, you know, when they reached out to us the holiday season around 2018 and I was going to you know, they reached out to me and, and I was like, I really didn't want to do it. I'm like, I don't want to do this again. I was like, I told this story. Like, what, what do we gain out of this? And um and then I, me and my dad talked and we weren't sure. And then we really fell in love with the producers, man. The two brothers, uh, Mac and Chap Way, they're great guys. And they kind of gave us a lot of assurances that we we're going to be able to tell our side of certain things. And, you know, obviously, look, the, you can't tell the story without a lot of negative and ugly in the end because it's just part of it. But we never felt like there was a lot of positivity. But, and then we're like, you know what, dad, screw it. Let's just do it. And we did it. And um, They did a great job. And I tell you, when it came out, 
I tell you, bro, it brought so many emotions out at me. Like I felt like I was back in 2004. You know, it was, I felt like we were back on Ive Street right at the rink. And I just almost immediately I fell back in love with hockey. And um, was it therapeutic also yeah, talking about yeah, it? Yeah, it, it was. It was. And um, I felt good with the people we were talking. Because I, you know, people, you know, even before the Netflix thing, you know, you'd have people, hey, we want to make a movie about this. And, I know where they're going with it. I know what they want. And I, I don't want to feed into certain things and um, sleazy people. And But these guys from the first day, I was like, these guys are good guys. I, I don't think they're going to sandbag us. And it ended up being pretty, you know, I guess successful. And um, Well, that's an understatement. It's a major Netflix <laughs> documentary. <laughs> it's weird, man. It's like, I don't like that even like it's, I don't. But it's a part of you. you yeah, know? It, is, it is. It is. And, um, and like something that's crazy too is that that year the HBO doc came out on yes. May. And then three months later, yes. Netflix. So it's about two people in the same town. And the I, you just said it, the ice arena was a street over from yes. where the nightclub was. It, it's all there. It's, it's like crazy. people used to go from the ice arena there. You yeah. know what I mean? It's like, it's crazy. And it's like, we never really crossed. Thankfully, probably for the <laughs> both of us, we never crossed at the time. But um, nah, man, it's true. And it's, I remember when, uh, I remember when your doc came out and, and the story, I remember a guy from HBO reached out and wanted permissions to you. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Ian's a great kid, blah, blah, blah. And, um, you know, it was, it was, it was, you know, it was, it was awesome. The doc was, and then it's like you said, like Danbury, Connecticut, like two major documentaries in one. I mean, that's. And then you have Glover Texera. Yeah. And I mean, then you, you have the John Oliver stuff yeah, with the, the mayor. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just like Danbury is just one of those random cities that just. It's no always, one ever heard of it. <laughs> but and there's just always something going on. That, and and it's just uh sometimes the stars align, man. It just I find it like so, so crazy to it this is. day because I think any I think I mean, unless you're from like New York City, I think when you know, where where you're from somewhere, when you see it in the news, it's kinda like, oh shoot, you know, that's where I'm from. But like with our situations, I mean, like you said, some like Netflix, HBO, like those are some heavy hitters. I mean, it's like when you see that, it's like, oh my God, it's like and you've been able to create a brand for a hockey team that doesn't even exist anymore. And that's Dude, one of the it's biggest. It's so crazy. The, it's the like well known every hockey day, teams. every day. Are the trashers coming back? No. Are the mm -hmm. trashers coming back? No. And it's like, I tell you, I've gotten the itch, bro. Like, like you know, I, my love for hockey kind of came back. And I'm trying to find ways to give back to hockey. And Look, you never know, man. You never know what could happen. But I just feel like if the trashers ever came back, it would be like the horrible sequel that it's just like. <laughs> it's like, it's a different time. Hockey's a different game. It's not as aggressive. Like I could never put a team together. Like we, I mean, but now, we find different ways. We find different ways to keep the name alive and, and do um, different things. And uh, and it didn't just stop with Netflix. Drake hits you up. Can you tell us the Drake story? Like what happened? Truth to God. Like, so, the, so Netflix, it was August 31st. Our episode came out. It was a Tuesday. That next day, the Wednesday, I'm sitting there and, you know, you know, it was the day after the doc first came out. So, you know, our Instagram followers went from 400 people to a few thousand. It was, you know, getting DMs all over the place. It's, it was overwhelming, to be honest with you. It was insane. I'm sure you went through the same exact thing. And uh, all of a sudden, this random guy, you know, DMing me. First of all, it just shows you how regular of a guy I am. I thought you had to answer every single DM. So I'm like, Ming, I got to stay home today. Uh, I can't go to the gym. I got to answer thousands. Of so I'm answering And this one guy's like, hey, that's pretty cool. Drake's following you. And I was like, what? And um, he screenshotted it. And I was like, and he followed the gym. He follows champs too. So I'm like, what the hell? So I'm thinking to myself, I'm looking if he messaged me, he didn't. And I'm just like, listen, man, this guy, if he follows you, he wants you to reach out to him. You know what I mean? Like maybe he doesn't want to be the first to reach. So I, I got no pride. I don't care. I'm like, hey, thanks for the follow, Dash AJ. You know what I mean? And dude, within 30 seconds, he reaches out. Oh my God, I just watched this doc last night, blah, blah, blah. This is crazy. I need... I need a jersey. He was releasing an album like that Friday or Saturday, Certified Lover Boy. And he's like, I need a jersey. And I'm like, Ian, I don't have jerseys. It's friggin' 2021, you know? So I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll get you one. You know what I mean? And then I'm thinking to myself, like, how the hell am I going to get him a jersey? Then in the gym, I had the inaugural Trasher jersey when we were doing the demo. 
they use my high school number and my name. And uh, it's framed, it was in a nice frame. I broke the glass, I took that shit right out. Didn't know you could just go behind and undo it nice, but I broke it, cause that's what we do. It's a trasher way to open a frame. I broke it and I was just like, hey, I got the jersey. And uh, he's like, bro, I need it, I leave. And he goes, I leave in two days to Houston and this and that. I'm like, well, first of all, it's got my name on it. He's like, no, I want what's your name on it. I'm like, it's 3X, that's how I used to wear it. You know, he goes, I don't care. So I'm like, how am I gonna get this to him? Cause again, um, there was still COVID parameters. He's in Toronto. I'm like, I can't, I was gonna take a flight. I didn't have my COVID vax at the time. I'm like, uh. So sure enough, he's like, I'll tell you what, he goes, I'll send a driver to Buffalo right over the border at this casino. And if you could get someone there, you know, I had a guy send him up, gave the Jersey and that was the end of it. And I was just like, uh, all right. Didn't talk to him. His album comes out that Friday night, I think at midnight. Ian, no exaggeration, ask my wife. Like one o'clock in the morning, I'm watching Seinfeld and, and my phone, like like a Christmas tree starts like lighting up. Like, like, dude, I'm like, honestly, the first thing I thought about is like, oh my God, did someone pass away? Like, this is, I'm, I'm scared. I'm like, Ian, the, the notifications, and I, I'm not trying to sound funny or cool. I'm telling you, there were so many notifications coming in, I couldn't operate the phone. So I go up to my wife. I'm like, Kim, can you call my mom? Or like, is, I think something's wrong. And my mom's like, what? Why are you calling me? Nothing. And I'm just like, my phone. So finally... Kim goes on and she, and she starts screaming. She's like, oh my God. I was like, what? And this guy takes a picture with the trasher jersey on. And I'm just like, dude, I felt like, I was, I was like, dude, it was one of the weirdest sensations. I, I was like, I, this is the craziest thing. And my phone for an hour, I couldn't even operate it. There were so many things coming in. We jumped up to like 20,000 followers. I was like, what the? First thing I'm thinking about is I don't have any jerseys to sell people because everyone's like, oh, where can I get a jersey? Where can I get? Dude, it was the craziest. I messed up. I'm like, oh, man, thank you, man. That was cool. You know, you probably brought, you know, a whole nother level of attention to this. Real humble guy. No, nah, no problem. I loved it. Bah, 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 bah. And, uh, it changed your life. Dude, the next day, I swear to God, you couldn't tell me anything. I'm very humble, but you couldn't tell me anything the next day. I'm driving. I'm listening. I'll be honest with you. I didn't really listen to Drake that much. I liked him. I'm not saying I was like a super fan, but you know, dude, I was playing his album. I'm driving around. I'm just like, I, I just couldn't believe it, man. And it was- It was just, the talk of Danbury. I remember going on. It was absolutely, it was absolutely, I don't think to this day people still can believe it. it that was, was just, probably the most shared photo in Danbury history. I mean, it was insane. And I was just like, how did this like happen? And, and then again, he just brought, it just shows you the power of marketing and, and social media and I mean, he just brought the attention to a whole nother level because then it was people who were not even hockey people were like loving the team, watching it. It reignited um, the trash. It was it was insane, man. It was, uh, I mean, I can't. The stars align. I can't, aligned, I can't exactly. It's, uh, sometimes it's just luck. I and mean, you created this massive merch brand too off of it. Yeah, and again, I, it's like, damn, I wish I, if I had a head start, if I knew he was going to do something like that, I would have been ready, ready, you know, but. Then it's like, oh God, all right, let's get some shirts. But then out. it let's probably say, wouldn't have worked that way. Yeah, of course not. No, but and people uh, could still buy merch now, right? Yeah, <laughs> excuse me. Yeah, yeah, and and again, I still get requests for jer. It's crazy because it's like, it's like it's a, it's just weird. You know what I mean? It's like you don't expect it to be a big thing, and it's become a, a whole nother thing. Man. What did your dad think about this? First thing he said with Drake, the, with everything, the documentary, Drake. You never know how to read my dad. See, my dad. He's never gonna be overly happy about anything. So we watched it. So the, the other thing people don't know is Netflix didn't give us like a sneak peek of this. Like it wasn't like we got a, a advanced viewing. So we were all on a little bit of pins and needles. You know what I mean? Cause we're like, say these guys sandbag us and it becomes like a hit piece or something. And so the day before, I remember we woke up early, we're watching it and um, my dad just stared at the TV and, and I could tell he liked it. He was just, but we're always on guard, we're waiting for the other shoe to drop. Like, uh, you know, these people are scum of the earth. You know, it never happened, thank God. But um, then when Drake happened, he was just like, you know, he didn't. He was like, "Who's Drake?" I was like, and then, you know, he, I was just like, "Dad, it's a big thing." And and then, you know, he just, uh, I'm happy for him because it's like, uh, I know deep down he gets a lot of pride out of it, and um, 
You know, it's it's it was, ultimately it was his creation. I mean, he's the one who had the idea and the balls to do it. Not a lot of, I mean, just like you, you had the balls to do something. It's you know, everyone has ideas. It's, do you have the balls to do it? And um, and really, I really believe from that doc is when he wanted to create. You know, Danbury's first San Gennaro festival on Ive Street, and um, we had it last September, and we're gonna have our second one the end of August, and. Um, you know, we're, we're even you. We're like architects. You know, it's in a different way, and and it's just like, I think he just kind of it reinvigorated him to be like, I want to create something again, like special. And um, I have to meet your dad. I still have never met him. Oh after yeah, all yeah. These years. Oh, and you know, another way we're connected is because he delivered oil to my parents' house. There you go. And he yeah. helped my dad kind of like he, get through with me being in prison. Yeah. No, I mean. Um, it's uh, it's just, you know, you do right by people. You just do the, you respect people. You never know where you're going to. I was once taught, look, the backs you step on today are going to be connected to the ass you got to kiss tomorrow. So you treat everybody. You, I try to keep it very even keel with people and, and respect. And it's the same thing you learn. Like, you know, I hope I never see prison, but God forbid, I was always taught you just be respectful, please. Thank you. Excuse me. You know, just be respect, mind your business, be respectful and it's the same thing in the visiting room. You yeah. know, I, I couldn't tell this crazy girl to, you know, leave me alone because I knew it was going to create a, a whole a whole war in there. You know what I mean? When you were put back in the spotlight a second time in your life, because not many people even get it the first time. Yeah. You got it twice. Are you navigating it differently? Because everyone's coming out of the woodwork. I don't take it as, you know, I don't. Are you cautious of who you surround yeah, yourself with? Yeah, yeah, very, very cautious um, because it's funny. You know, the doc comes out and obviously there's, you know, things in there about, you know, uh, you know what my dad was allegedly involved with or not involved with. And, uh, and then all of a sudden people come, they want to start talking, you name dropping. Oh, you know this guy, you know that guy. And I'm like, oh, you know, I'm very, you know, it's weird. It's, it's um, Ultimately, the reaction to the documentary and everything that's come from it has been very positive, but I'm very gun shy and I just remember old times. And it's like, I, I'm very, it's almost like I don't want to get too happy with things because it's like, I know just like that, it can, it, it's could be gone, man. So I'm very, very cautious, very cautious to be honest with you. And, um, you know, it's just, a, it's just a way it is. It's better that way. But you know, I navigate it where I don't, I don't get too high. I don't get too low. You know, my life has changed from the documentary, but it hasn't changed. I still go to work. I still eat the same stuff every, you know, I still, you know, nothing. I'm not trying to be something I'm not. I'm not, you know, taking trips to Miami or Dubai. You know, I'm not, I'm not trying to be a celebrity, dude. Like I'm just, you, you know me, I can, you find me at the gym every day, basically. You know, I'm, I'm very, almost too accessible, but that's just how I am. You know, yeah. I really don't care, you know? You know what I realized? It's like when I got out of prison, I wanted to be famous and, you know, I thought it was all about my story with the club and this and that, and I got the taste of it from HBO. Yeah. And when I stopped chasing that, that's when things finally came together for me. Like Dude. I am so much more humble now and just rooted in the fact that this is bigger than me yeah and not focused on yeah, me being I mean, famous and that's the thing is the people that have the longevity in life are, are the ones who who it's not about them you know what i mean it's about the, what's the mission what what am i taking this locked in podcast what's the it's not about ian bick it's about you you're the creator but like you said different perspectives getting different sides of it because i know Trust me, I know. Like guys go to prison, and it's like in girls, you know, you know, there's, you know, they're pieces of shit. You know, that's and it's not. You know, mm -hmm. I know a lot more pieces of shit that never seen a jail cell that 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 are worse than people I know that did some real serious stuff. So it's just it's it, like you said, it's like you're creating something that's bigger than yourself, and those are the that's the longevity of it. And it's the same thing. I mean, um, I think people like to trash a story because it's it was very authentic. Um, we weren't trying to go viral because there was no viral. You know, nowadays, like I said, you see people want to be famous so bad, dude. It's like they'll do anything. Let me eat a bag of rocks. You know what I'm saying? And like TikTok does yeah, that, dude. They let me, that. dude. And it's like, and it's not these kids' fault. It's just what they see. You know, I mean, it's just like, you know, let me, let me step on nail. I mean, it's just. But I don't. You know, I'm not one of these older guys. I mean, I'm not old, but I feel like I'm 80. But I'm not one of these. Different generation guys like all oh, these kids are dumb. It's just what they know. I mean, I was wrestling backyard wrestling in the nineties. 
jumping off ladder. I mean, I was an idiot too, you know, but it's just what the kids see. But these kids, they just, they want to be famous so bad. And then you say to yourself, all right, let's say you go viral. Let's say you get picked up. What are you going to do? Now what? What? What's, how are you going to make it better for the people around you? Or what are you going to build from that? You know what I mean? And a lot of these kids wouldn't know what to do. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's like, yeah, everyone wants to do this and that, but all right, so what are you going to take what are you gonna what are you gonna make with what the ingredients you're given? And we're constantly evolving, constantly changing. Like I'm not that kid six months ago that was yeah. posting selfie videos about owning a nightclub yeah. and stuff. It's just so you much have different. to you have to. And then that's the thing with the trasher story is there was only two seasons. So it was wild, it was crazy. There's some stories that still haven't been told yet. But frankly, bro, there's only two se- there's not much more I can say about this this team because we only had two years, n- yeah, so not even. Where do you go next? What, what's Because you're always thinking, you know, you have yeah. that entrepreneurial mindset. What's next for AJ Galante, the trashers, everything? You know, I think, um, I think when it comes to the trashers, it's how do I make the trashers, and it maybe it half-asses there already, but how do I make when people hear trashers, what do they think aside from the dock or hockey? Like, how can I expand it into you know, uh, something, you know, how does it become like an adjective? Oh, he's a trasher. You know what I mean? Like, how do I, how do I, how do I keep, how do I keep the brand visible without the documentary? You know, how in 10 years can people still, like, it's still relevant. And there could be a five-year-old in 10 years from now that wasn't even alive for the documentary that know what the trash, I don't know. I don't know if there's an answer. I don't know if there's an end game, but just pushing that, like that trasher brand, what does it mean? Like, you know, what, like, yo, I want to be like, yo, you're a trasher. You know what I mean? Like, wh- it sounds stupid now, but how do we make it? Like, how do you, like, how do you make it where it's like, you know, it, it stands for something other than a trash can and a hockey stick? You know what I mean? So, yeah. but I don't know. I don't, I, Ian, I swear, I wish I had a better handle on, I wish I had a 10 year plan. I don't know. I just, you're still uh, trying to figure it I, out. I just, dude, you know what? My favorite movie possibly of all time was Dark Knight. I'm a huge Batman fan. I love fan. Dark Knight. Heath yeah. Ledger has a line that I think is the greatest line of all time and honestly describes me to a T. He says, he, when he's talking to Harvey Dent, he goes, you know what I am? I'm a dog chasing cars. I wouldn't know what to do if I caught one. I just do things. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't have a plan. And that's really, in a, and it's kind of scary to say that, but it's true. I mean, um, you know, I'm a father now. I want to be able to provide a good life for my son. I want him to learn a lot of the old school values I was taught, but I know he's going to be different. And I don't want him to follow me to a team. I want him, you know, everyone says, oh, he's going to play hockey. I hope not. I want him to play golf. You know, I want him to play tennis or something. You know, I got a little softer. I shouldn't say that, but I softened when my son was born. I got a little softer and, uh, I can't imagine him skating around like I used to do and running into people going crazy. You know what I mean? And it's like, um, I want him to have certain value, but I want him to just be his own guy. You know what I mean? I don't want him to ever feel like I'm in the shadow of dad or grandpa. Or yeah. I just want him to just be healthy, happy, you know? What's your message to the people that are different, to the people that are like you, like me, that are creators, creative, and maybe are afraid to take that risk dude, or think outside the box? I would say, dude, fail fail put it out there fail and you know what you're gonna learn so much from failures because look i failed i've had so many ideas that have like one out of every hundred of my ideas seem to work but i keep shooting i keep i I will keep throwing shit to the wall fail because that because if you start off right off the bat success you're gonna get comfy you're gonna think it's sweet is you fail put it out there fall on your ass get up Keep going, man. Shoot the shots. Uh, You know what? I mean, I'm not saying lose all your money or your life savings, but I'm saying put it out there. Just I know it's scary because there's there's things now. Like I have my my best friend in the world. Um, In case they're both watching, I have two best friends in the world. But one of my best friends in the world um, came out with his own clothing line in a year, and I remember right before he was he was flirting with the idea, and um, I could see he was unsure. And I'm like, Manny, do it. Just do it. Just do it, bro. And in one year, he's he's done stuff with ex NFL players. He's got um he's been working with this big NASCAR guy. Just do it. And, and you know what? 
what's going to happen? What's the worst that's going to happen? I mean, don't throw your life savings away, but just go for it, man. And, and you're going to learn from the failures. Because trust me, I mean, I've had more failures than success. I mean, um, but that's where you learn. The best lessons are the most expensive or the most time costly. That's that's my opinion. And you don't know what's going to be your next win. I mean, no, I've failed. like you just yeah. said, you're never going to know when the win's coming. You, you know don't. what I mean? You just keep... Look, if you show up every single day, eventually the stars are just, you know, that full moon, the stars. I mean, you could just, I just tell, I tell the young kids all the time, just dude, just keep showing up. You got to, people want consistency. If they know you're going to be there and you're going to be in the corner and they know, they look behind you're there, the opportunities are going to come. The trainers, dude, I got young kids training guys and look, there's got, I, there's a couple kids in particular, they're always there. And I just know. All right, I'll give it to this guy. I know he's going to be there. And yeah. he's, a couple of my trainers now, they're, they're booming. They got 20, 30 kids, you know what I mean? And that's making a lot of, you know, making good money for a boxing trainer. Yeah, you got to keep crying. Just keep, just fail, just fail, bro. Because um, you know what? It sounds like a weird thing to say, but just fail because that is where you're going to know if you're built for this. Because if you fail once and you're done, you weren't built for this. If you fail and say, you know what? Let me let me feel bad for a day or two. I get up, learn, tweak, and then you're gonna be successful. That's I mean, how you're gonna learn. Yeah, it took me ten years to figure it out. Yeah, like ten and years. So, of and in <laughs> and in uh, in one year, I guarantee you're gonna be in a position you personally where you're like, damn, I couldn't even believe like a year ago I'm here now. I mean, you might think that now, but in a year, I guarantee you, you personally are gonna be in a position where it's like. I wasn't even thinking like this was possible. I mean, I'm just so blessed and grateful for like how this is because this could have been another failure because the whole sure, Danbury everything. knows I failed a lot, you know. But that's but, but you know what, <laughs> Danbury's a blue collar town, and Danbury should realize, hey, listen, you know what, he's one of us, and you know what, kids make you know your kid, dude. I mean, half these Dudley Do Rights when they were our age were doing way worse stuff than we were. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's the truth. I was 17 years old, and know? I was 17 when I started. So so you know what, kids, listen. I don't, you know what, you, you you know, bird in the hand, bro. You got to, the people that are in your corner, that's who you got to center it around. And everyone else who doesn't like it, it's a reflection on their failures. And they just realize, hey, I'm never going to do anything worthwhile. And you know what? Fuck them, bro. <laughs> you know? AJ, where can people find you at? Oh, uh, at DB Trashers on Instagram. Yes, I control the Instagram. <laughs> so I I try to answer everybody. Um Oh God! I came out with a per. Uh, we talked about this. I actually yeah. came out with a personal said, Instagram a few years ago. One. I think it's at official we'll underscore AJ. Yeah, please. I don't even know. I'm there. And uh, check out the festival. Yeah, You're yeah. Working August, on a podcast. Too. Yeah, working. Yes, working. You've inspired me too, man. And um, same thing. Going into something, no idea what I'm doing. We're gonna throw it to the wall and see uh, see where it all. See where it all uh, and getting, shakes out. And getting me a fight, too. We need well, that. that's going to be easy, the way you've been working. And, and uh, listen, don't let Ian fool you. I, I get the reports and, uh, you know, that's that's the best way to sneak up on someone. They don't see it coming. So that they're coming to a ring near you, for uh, sure. Dude, we're going to sell out the ice arena, man. I'm oh, I, you, man. I see it. It's in the... It's in the it's in the atmosphere. I see it, bro. AJ, thank you so much, man. Of course. You've been a great friend to me. And Same I, I'm here, looking man. forward to, you know, continuing our friendship, our relationship. Absolutely. And yeah. Thank you so much, bro. And I'm excited to get this episode out here. Appreciate and, uh, you guys. And, you know, thank really you. inspire some people. Hopefully. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, guys.